Hey guys, what's up? Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's another one of our Slant Alpha adventures. We're up here in the Great White North and uh, facing the typical kind of weather you would expect this time of year in the Great White North. I am going to do something that I prefer not to do, I try not to do often, uh, but because we've got a super long flight for you uh, on tap tonight, we are going to just kind of get right into the prep of the plane, get the plane up and running and airborne, and then I will stop and catch you up with uh, what is going on as far as the, the flight planning and routing and uh, weather briefing and all that stuff. So I'm just going to really kind of just launch into the uh, aircraft starting. I want you to go ahead and pile in, grab your seats, and get comfortable. And, you know, like I said, we'll catch you up with the, the overall plan for the evening a little bit later once we get up and running. Uh, we are just the big picture stuff, I guess I can tell you. We're resuming this Douglas Overseas tour in which we took this AeroWorks Douglas DC-3 out of Martin State Airport, Baltimore, Maryland, USA. And in a series of hops that we've been making eh, off and on on the stream for a good, oh, better part of two years almost now. Uh, up the east coast of the U.S., eastern Canada, uh, Greenland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, the U.K., down and around a tour of coastal and island Mediterranean stops, and then back up through uh, through Europe and England, and uh, basically the back the way we have uh, came. We're back over onto the North American continent officially as of this most recent Douglas Overseas episode. We've got this one for you tonight, and we've got two more for you after this, and we'll be back home in Baltimore after 12,000 plus, maybe even 13,000 miles of a tour so far. I maybe have to add it up and see. But anyway, like I said, this particular leg is going to take us from Goose Bay in the extreme northeastern Canada down to Moncton, which is right there on the northeast part of uh, I guess Canadian mainland right before you head over the North Atlantic if you're doing the traditional jet path across the uh, across the pond as they say um, but it is going to be a little bit of, a little bit of a long one uh, it's about a 450 mile flight straight line but we're going to be doing it a little longer and I'll explain why as we get up and running but like I said because it's going to be almost a five hour flight tonight I'm going to try and get to it as quickly as I can and then we'll catch you all up with the routing and planning once we get up and running. So here we are in the aircraft. You guys, like I said, are hopefully piling in, grabbing your seats and uh, getting settled in. And I'm gonna go ahead and get the master battery switch on. No smoking, nav and beacon lights can come on. The fuel tanks can go into uh, mains, left main and right main. Oops, I gotta remember my view commands. Uh, the cowl flaps can come open. That's those uh, sink handles. We'll rotate those all the way to the left. We'll get the prop lever full forward while we're waiting on that. Crack the throttles just a little bit. And we will start with just the number two engine as we put the mix into auto rich magnetos. The fuel pump. We'll prime it. We'll clear it. And we will start her up. Yeah, that's not a hundred percent realistic startup procedure, but it's yeah, you know, it's closest that the AeroWorks modelers could come up with, and not too bad. I mean, we're checking the oil pressure, which came up right away. The fuel pressure is artificially elevated because of that electric pump being on. So with that, go ahead and pop that off, and we should see that the pump is now the uh, engine is now supplying its own fuel pressure. And so that's good, and everything else looks good, and the pressures and temps are heading into their normal ranges as we speak. So, got a good start on the number two. With that, we can go ahead and get some electricity going through the aircraft. That number two acts essentially as our APU back in the day uh, in a DC-3. You get bored off right off of the ramp with the number two running, but because since you're boarding over on the number one side, that's considered safe to do. We've already sent our flight plan. The progress bar up at the top of your screen reflects what we're doing, so we're good there. Let's go ahead and bring X-Pilot over onto the screen and get ourselves... Oh, look at this. Who do we have? CZEG. Is that... I think that's... Um, I think that's Gander Radio, so I don't think that's going to help us out at all. 
Who is that? Oh, is that? Uh, that's um, Edmonton. Okay, so that's not going to help us out at all. So we're on our we're over by our lonesome over here. We'll just go ahead and get a METAR observation at Goose Bay. C Y Y R. Just do dot METAR right into the uh, pilot client and the ICAO code of the airport that you need. Wind is one seven zero at three. Two nine or eight one is the altimeter. Nothing to worry about visibility. Well, we do have uh, thirty clouds at thirty two hundred feet, which we can see that it's not perfect clear weather today, but uh, we will be IFR. And I'll show you that route here in a moment. Um, but uh, twenty nine eighty one. It's good to be back where we get that in an altimeter rather than having to convert it from millibars. Although the conversion is not too terribly difficult, Lot, lots of altimeters have both on them. Uh, th this particular one does not, but uh, the conversion hasn't been too terrible to do. This two nine or eight one. The field elevation here, by the way, we we expect that it should be somewhere around 150 feet, and the chart says it's 160 feet. Yep. So we're okay. We're reading 20 feet low, and that's plenty good. You know, normally within 75 or so, I say, that's uh, all well and good. Nobody to obtain our clearance with. And since we're back over into uh, North America, we'll go ahead and set 2200 as our squawk code. It's not really a real-world squawk code for IFR without a squawk assigned, but 2200 will do for that sim purposes. Uh, nav and ADF tuners. Uh, I'm going to tune, and I'll, I'll talk about why in just a moment, because, again, I, have, I, I want to I talk through the, the route planning process. But we are going to be on this airway that goes off of 146 radial from Goose Bay. So I'm going to tune 173, 117.3 and 146. Uh, looks Okay, 117.3 was already in NAV 2, it looks like. 117.3, uh, and we're four miles from that. And then we're going to tune the 146 off of it. Just spin that all the way around. So there's 150. Crank that back. One, two, three, four notches there. So there's a 146. So that'll be our first navigation step, and I will talk about what's after that uh, once we get up and running again. I do want to get the plane going. And then I'll talk more about the flight planning process and the routing that we're going to be using today. Uh, radio altimeter can be set to 1x as it gets up to 400 feet. That's my cue to pull flaps in and reduce power from takeoff to climb. And check our fuel quantity. We're starting with a ton of fuel. Starting with 750 gallons of fuel. What's that, what is that divided by 4? Well, 800 divided by 4 would be 200 gallons. So, multi so 200 minus, uh, let's see, minus 12 and a half. So it will be 200, 980 something gallons per tank, basically. 187 gallons per tank. Let's, let's look and see what we got. Yeah, well, that's about what we're reading. Right main's a little bit lower because we've been sitting here running at number two. We'll rebalance the fuel later. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what we got. So that's good. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain. On behalf of Slant Alpha Airways, we'd like to welcome you aboard Flight 514 Service to Moncton. We'll be departing here from the terminal momentarily, expecting an on-time departure with wheels up at 20 after the hour. Cruising altitude today is going to be just 6,000 feet, and flight time once airborne, just a hair shy of 5 hours, 4 hours, 55 minutes. So please do buckle in and relax. We will be underway soon. Thanks for flying Slant Alpha Airways. By the way, I didn't talk about what, uh, I checked that METAR, winds 170 something something, uh, but I think we can just go off of 26. It was like 170 at 3, I think it was. We, we could, for a wind 170, you probably would want runway 16, but because it's 3 knots and we're parked here, uh, matter of fact, I can just go uh, 26 at taxiway, whatever that is that I just drew over. So that's going to be our taxi out plan. At Bravo, it looks like. So 2 6 at Bravo, that'll be fine. Let's 
go ahead and get the uh, doors closed up here. There we go. Is this plane equipped with a porta potty? It is, Papa Charlie. It is. Matter of fact, do I have do I have a view? Uh, I might. Yeah, I don't think I do. But yeah, we got one back there. Let's go ahead and get the seatbelt. Whoops, sorry. Seatbelt lights on. Go ahead and get the number one fired up. Mix, magnetos, fuel pump, prime it, clear it, and start it. All right, oil pressure comes up right away. Fuel pressure artificially elevated. Let's go ahead and shut off the fuel pump, turn on the generator. We can see the fuel pressure settles in where it should be, so we're good. Let's go ahead and sync our headings now. Looks like we're facing 350 on the nose. Let's make sure that our gauges all agree. Uh, that there, the top half of that gauge, it's just the autopilot target heading. I'm going to set that to zero just so I'm not looking at the wrong thing. Bottom half there is what we want to set to 350. That, yeah, that would be the correct way. And then we'll make sure the directional gyro here is also set to 350. This is where you would do a uh, flight control check. Obviously, we're not really checking the yoke movement, but we're just checking the uh, outside control surfaces to make sure that they move freely and correctly as commanded. Somebody outside the plane will check everything for us and give us a big thumbs up. So we will presume that that's been done. Trim for takeoff will be set. I just set it neutral on this plane. There might be a uh, there might be a preferred trim setting, but neutral seems to work for me. And uh, we'll go ahead and set flaps one. You don't normally do a flaps one departure in a DC three unless you're taking off short, short field. But I like the way the plane handles. Uh, a little bit better in that flaps one configuration for takeoff, so that's what I do. Uh, tail wheel can come unlocked, and uh, in the real DC three, I believe that the real rear rearward is locked, but in this model of it, that uh, unlocks the tail wheel. We've already talked about the taxi route. We're going to go straight up to the north and then out on two six, and we'll go ahead and get the taxi lights on. And uh, wheels up two minutes from now. Yeah, I think we can do it. I think we're good. Uh, let me make sure that we're on 22.8. We are. <clears throat> Goose Bay traffic, Douglas 514 Delta Victors. Taxiing up to runway 26 at Bravo for IFR eastbound departure Goose Bay. Notice I said eastbound. We're actually going southwestbound, but our initial direction is definitely going to be eastbound, so that's what I went with for the call. That's what's more pertinent to the traffic around us, at least, anyway. Uh, notice, by the way, the rudder pedals, I, it's just a habit that I move the rudder pedals to turn. Rudder pedals really aren't turning us at all. You're, you're steering more with the differential braking. Uh, would be steering with differential throttle as well, but I just have the one throttle lever in this plane, so not really doing that. But steering with braking and the brake pedals, uh, the, yeah, the brake, the toe brakes on the rudder pedals aren't really animated, so you're not seeing that too well. But that the movement of the rudder pedals as I taxi is really just habit more than anything. Now, so this should be Bravo. Two six at Bravo. Yep, that's what we wanted to do. Goose Bay traffic, Douglas 514 Delta Victor departing 26 at Bravo. We're going to be left downwind IFR eastbound Goose Bay. As we take the uh, runway, anti collisions can come on, landing lights off, taxi light on, pitot heat on, and fuel pumps on. Cows can go in the trail. Ready, guys? 
Yeah, we're getting off on time, too. Yeah, we'll show you, we'll talk more about the routing that I've chosen once we get up and running, because we're gonna, I'm going to need to punch that into Sky Vector anyway. Haven't done that yet, but I wanted to kind of talk through how I came up with the route that I came up with. Why are we going to do a five-hour flight when we could do this in about three? Well, I'll, well, we'll talk about it. All right, temps and pressure's all looking good. Engines responding normally and symmetrically. Tailwheel locked. Locked, I said. Go ahead and set our takeoff. Those Pratt and Whist Pratt and Whitney. I never say it right the first time. Pratt and Whitney twin wasps roaring to life. There she goes. Tail goes flying on her own. We'll put just a little bit of elevator up to hold that uh, level attitude. And when she gets up to the right speed, she just lifts off on her own. That's why I love that flaps one takeoff. No rotation involved. Again, not really textbook in this plane. Just the way I prefer that uh, she handles. We'll keep the runway heading until about 400 feet. Gear have come up. And then we get through four. We'll pull the flaps in, reduce power, start that crosswind turn. Twenty-five and forty. And yeah, we'll get the nose down, try and get the speed up. We were at twenty-six, so our crosswind is uh, seventeen, I guess. Goose Bay traffic, Douglas 514 Delta Vic, clear 26 from the left crosswind, turning left downwind, IFR eastbound. Goose Bay. Alright, turn into a 080. And then basically back onto that right crosswind once we intercept that. Uh, well, we got to fly to that VOR first of all. We'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about the routing a little bit more in a minute. Uh, so there's coming up on eight. There we go. Take her up to 6,000. Keep 40 in the manifold, 25 in the RPMs. Those down just a little bit. After departure, also, you can get those fuel pumps off. Don't need those. It's just backups. All right, so at this point, navigationally, we're just direct to the Goose VOR here. So now that we're leaving the airport environment, I guess. I guess. Yeah. And so now we'll, now we'll start just a gentle right turn to intercept that Goose VOR. And once we get up to six, you know, again, we're going we're gonna to intercept that VOR, and then we're going to go outbound on a 146 or whatever I said. And then once we get established on that 146 and we're at 6,000, we'll talk about the routing, how I came up with it, where we're going. Looks like we're getting blown northward. Because I keep having to turn right to get back on a direct course there. This is X-Plane 11, but we do have that uh, enhanced Skyscapes mod running. So some 
really nice volumetric clouds there. Very affordable add-on. Alright, so we're just about to pass over that VOR. You can see the distance counting down on the lower left. Eh, it might be hidden by my logos, but there's 0 0.7, 0 point, uh, yeah, 0 0.7 passing now. Needle starting to swing. We're through 35. We're still climbing. Manifold pressure still 40. We're still climbing at a good airspeed. Okay, VOR is kind of flip-flopped over there as we've flown over it. Let's go ahead and start a right turn. So we overshot. We turned late. We're going to be on a 146. We know that we got to turn a little bit more southbound because of the wind. Uh, but indeed, I'm going to turn to about a 170 just to re-intercept that course that we overshot. So catch it on the far side there. <laughs> Shouldn't take too much of a correction for too long. The closer you are to the VOR, the, the quick, more quickly your angle from it changes. So don't overdo the corrections when you're this close in. Coming through some IMC now. IMC, AKA, I can't see. So while we're watching that needle start to come in, okay, let's check the outside air temps. Ah, uh, yeah, they're well below. I mean, they're kind of in that range where you might need to worry about icing. So since we are Invisible moisture and freezing temps. Let's go ahead and pop those uh, anti-icing on. Okay, that needle has come back to center. Let's get back to our target heading of 146. But again, we knew we were having to correct. Man, I can't really tell what's level. i got to rely on the attitude indicator here to tell me what's level because out the window... You kind of can see the horizon a little bit, but you can't really rely on that because that could be just a change in the cloud layer. Who knows? Stuff like that can fool you. So I'm going to just keep, keep it right on 1.5 here, and we'll see what happens with our course and see if it stays that or see if we need to correct right or left maybe for wind. We're 5,000 still climbing. And our target altitude is 6. Okay, so now that the, the course is drifting off to the left, so we're going to need to correct to the right in order to stay on it. So we need to turn a little extra southbound, in other words, to stay on this eastbound, southeastbound course. So the wind obviously blowing south to north here. Five hundred to go. Uh, manifold pressure slipped. I should keep it up to forty. As you climb, it kind of slips because the air gets less dense. The pilot gets more dense. All right, so one sixty did put us back on that course. I'm gonna gonna bring it back to about a one fifty five maybe to see if that'll hold that course for us. And we're coming up on 6,000 as well, so get her settled in on 155. We'll get the wings level. Looks like we're through. Well, we're kind of bopping through the cloud tops here. We might decide later on to take it up to 8. Let's just go ahead and get it stable at 6, first of all. Eh, looks like the clouds might be clearing up just a little bit. Uh, you know what? Eh, since we're still at climb power, let's just do it now. Let's just go up another two. If we if we were on with air traffic control, we would just request it. Moncton Center, Douglas 514 Delta Victor, level at 6,000, requesting 8,000 for weather. And it's a... Uh, okay, A, eh, Douglas 514 Delta Victor, climb to maintain 8,000, eh?
little more manifold pressure to keep it up to 40. Sir Skidmore is here. How are you, Sir Skid? There's seven, so one to go. That manifold pressure up to 40. Keep that heading on about a 155. Looks like it's working out for us pretty well, wind correction wise. It's 500 to go. And again, I, I, I still need to get on that sky vector and show you guys what I plotted. Again, if you join late, we got airborne pretty early because this is a very long flight tonight. And so we kind of kind of were just like, well, let's get let's get going. And then I'll show you the flight planning that went into it. Alright, coming up on eight, and I think this is gonna look a little bit better cloud wise here. Uh, we'll keep it at 25 and 40. While we level it at 8, we're going to continue to add some down trim. While the plane picks up speed. The faster it goes, the more lift it generates. That means the more nose down you have to fly in order to stay level. Uh, I don't want to add that much nose down trim, though. We want to keep it at 8,000. Alright, we're pretty close to our cruise air speed now, so I'm going to slowly pull the power down to our cruise settings of 23 on the manifold, uh, 23 in the RPMs rather, and then 34 on the manifold. Actually, you should pull the manifold down first, because pulling the props, pulling the prop governor down actually increases manifold pressure puts more stress on the engines, like shifting the car from 4th to 5th. So it means the RPMs come lower, but you're pushing harder on that uh, crankshaft. So there's 23 and 34. Looks like we're just a little bit right, of course, now. Because I've been, I've been flying more of a 160 than a 155. So that's okay. We'll come back to about a 150. We'll pop it into uh, navigation mode in the autopilot. Let auto shake the rest of that correction out for us. And I'm going to try and just get it nice and tr trimmed out, level stable at 8,000. I'm going to spin the target heading around to 15 just to have it. Even though we're really going to be going into nav mode here. It's always good to have the heading set to approximately where you're going to have it anyway. Alright, I am more or less hands off here. 23 and 34. Nice and stable at 8,000. We've got a nice slight correction into our course going. Let's go ahead and let auto have it, guys. What do you say? Autopilot on. Uh, let's just do heading mode for now and level. Okay, and we'll keep that 150. Keep that 150 until the needle centers, and then we'll hand it back to auto. The reason I don't like kicking it into nav mode right now is that the autopilot is going to make this 
really radical left turn to get back on this course. And I don't want it to do that. I want a nice gentle intercept just a couple degrees off. Yeah, I feel like it's coming back in the center. There we go. Maybe we'll maybe we'll shade it just a couple more degrees to the left there. Now it's, now it's nice and centered. We'll go ahead and throw that into nav mode. Which is there. And it's still put in a nice <laughs> harsh correction to start tracking that course for us. But it's alright. Pro Coastman with that subscription. That's now a three-month run for Pro Coastman. Thank you so much. And some some uh, autopilot says, friend of all, have a half bank option. Yeah, this one's not one of them. Yeah, this one in particular, I feel like, tends to make really radical corrections for for no real reason. Let's go ahead and get the seatbelt signs off as we have arrived at cruise. I think we can get the icing stuff off as well. Uh, go ahead and close up the cow flaps. Uh, close to be this way. Uh, we know in this plane we do need to leave them open just a little bit. We'll check on the cylinder head temps in just a moment just to make sure they're not running away. But I think we are good. We shall let you guys know that you're free to move about the cabin, as we say. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached our cruise altitude of 8,000 feet, and we have turned off the fastened seatbelt signs. The cabin crew is going to come around shortly with a fine selection of Red Bull products, Tim Hortons, and Boatin. So please relax and enjoy the flight. What else can we do? A couple other things we can do here, guys. We can uh, get the mix into auto lean. And we get that radio altimeter into 10x for our descent. Um, I do, I do want to go ahead and rebalance the fuel. We did sit on the ramp and run the number two a little bit longer than we ran the number one. So the right main is, is about... Okay, the right main's... 160 on the nose so just to get the left main down to 160 let's run both engines off of that left main just for a few moments and we'll see how well or poorly that works out as I do or don't remember that I've just done that by the way did uh, recently add fuel rebalancing as a channel meme since I tend to screw it up so famously on this channel so often Figured we might as well clue the new folks in on the running joke. One undocumented checklist item out of the way. Strongbow is here. It is the Aeroworks Douglas DC-3. For X-Plane 11. Beautiful ortho scenery and uh, enhanced cloudscapes. Ah, oh, there's, there's an ortho seam there, so that's not so pretty, but, but that is. <laughs> and a nice custom livery made for us by our friend of the channel, Northwest Orient. So there she is. Now, how, how have I talked long enough to get the, uh, the fuel balance redone? Uh, still got a couple gallons to go. Again, the right main's at 160. We're running both plane, both engines off the left main right now. 
because as we sat on the ramp powering up the plane, we were running just the number two, and that's why the right side got a little bit lighter than the left. Not, the, not that three or four gallons is really that big a deal, but on this channel, I just tend to obsess over that kind of stuff. Fuel, uh, fuel cylinder attempts are looking pretty perfect there. You want them just under 200, so that's that's good. Let's run the tanks off of that left main just for a few more minutes, and then let me go ahead and show you what my thoughts were as it pertains to the routing. So we're going Goose Bay down to Moncton, and the direct is a direct path is 463 nautical miles. When we came up this way, we did kind of do a VFR, more or less VFR. We did a little bit of dead reckoning over. Uh, this body of water here, whose name I can't remember, um, and this was called uh, Antioch Island or something along those lines. Prince Edward Island down here, Island of Newfoundland down here. Um, it's not Antioch, but it's something close to that. So, my thought tonight was, we've done so much on this tour, tour this Douglas Overseas Tour, where we're flying a non-RNAV aircraft IFR in airspace that doesn't really support when we were over in Europe at least speaking thereof non-RNAV IFR in airspace that doesn't really support that anymore so I said well you know we're back in new, new uh, North America I have proper charts proper IFR charts for these Canada does have proper non-RNAV IFR routes so I was like, all right, well, I know the direct path isn't going to work, and these blue lines are all basically RNAV paths. You would have to have a GPS in order to locate this point, Alcob. You, uh, you might have, obviously, you can dir fly direct September Isles there, but uh, the reason this is a non-RNAV path, I mean, an RNAV path probably means that there's some area in the middle here where neither of these two radio transmitters can be received so that's why that's not a traditional conventional nav airway it's blue meaning you can only navigate it by uh, a GPS and those of you new to the channel this channel we simulate the fact that we do not have GPS capability on board so I'm flying just through the old-school radio based navigation for tonight anyway so I'm like all right let's look at the conventional nav airways we have. We got an, a, a conventional nav airway that goes like way out here to the west and then uh, you know maybe down here and then maybe can hop across to here. Okay well then if we're here and we're trying to go southbound then this is this is only a uh, RNAV airway also. This is an RNAV point here. So then all right well that doesn't get us anywhere. That, that puts us at a dead end. We can go all the way out to the west and uh, down through Mont Jolie, but that's like way out of the way. And then we got to come back to the east, and we've got this weather that's moving in from the west, which we're probably going to end up hitting anyway by the time we get there. But I figured, well, let's not route ourselves right through the weather. If we're going to take conventional navigation airways, let's route ourselves east around the weather, away from the weather, over uh, Newfoundland, and use these conventional na um, navigation airways. So it's like, all right, well, the first thing I'm gonna, I need to do is go direct to the Goose VOR, which you saw us do right after we took off. Then we're going to go outbound on this 146, and the next point we're going to get to, and by the way, what you have here is a VOR airway, the AR-13, that parallels an NDB airway, this AR-21. Because the VORs and the NDBs are very near each other, but they're not directly at the same place. And you got this, and they're on both ends. It's the same thing here. Unusual, but, you know, again, up, up, up north, who knows? Iowa Scotsman here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you checking in. But anyway, so we're on the VOR one because we're navigating this 146 radial outbound from the Goose VOR. That's why we have 146 set in here, and we can see that it's nice and centered. And we've been doing that for 47 miles now. I think we've still got some time. That's why I'm not panicking to uh, talk through this. I, I don't remember what the distance of this first leg is, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a it's a 
it's a it's a mass, it's a big number. We're, we're flying a big number distance. And how many miles until we make the navigation switch? Uh, half of a big number. Anyway, so so that's the first leg. We'll drag that out there. We're never going to um, that St. Anthony VOR, which is called Yay. I love it. We're headed to Yay. And Sky Vector very kindly put in that airway for us automatically, which is good. All right, so after Yay, where are we going? Well, again, this the airway that that gets us m most closely in the direction we want to go from there heads down here to Deer Lake. So let's drag the path over to Deer Lake. We'll select Deer Lake VOR YDF. It puts that airway in for us, Victor 381. Uh, just while we're looking at that, let's... Okay, I guess we're still... Uh... I guess we're still not technically in moisture, but well, let's keep an eye on things, guys. If our indicated airspeed suddenly starts to drop inexplicably, uh, which... Maybe it is. If power output... Oh, look at the... Well, first of all, the manifold pressure dropped when I put the mix into lean. So let's get it back up into 34, first of all. So let's just watch. If that airspeed starts to drop all of a sudden, then we'll have to assume we're picking up ice either on our wings or our props. And we'll uh, get some anti-icing running in that uh, situation. Okay, cylinder head temps are looking good. I uh, just increased the manifold pressure, so I'm going to open the cow flaps up just a little bit. So we'll just double check that in a little bit here. What's the outside air temps? Probably well below freezing. Yeah, so we're 20 below. I've always heard below 10 below, you don't have to worry about icing as much. So we'll, maybe we'll be okay. But going th right through visible moisture like this, it's definitely something to keep in mind. And so we're indicating about 145. If it suddenly starts to drop no uh, for no reason, like I said, we'll we'll assume icing is uh, is the is the cause. Smitty is here. How are you, man? All right, so let's go back to what we were talking about with the routing. And by the way, what is the distance of this first leg? It's not really marked on the chart, so if we were just going to make that a straight leg, Sky Vector will then tell us. 193 miles. All right, so the, if we switch navigation at the halfway point, let's just tune 13.7 on nav 2 and see if we're receiving anything. We got 17.3 and 13.7. I wonder if that's done on purpose. Whoops. 13, 17, 3, 13, 7. Let's just turn the DME on the NAV 2. Yeah, no, there's no, no, no reading on it just yet. Presumably that's a station that has DME. The icon with the box around it says that it does, so. So that just means we're not yet receiving it. But 100 and, what did it say? 193 miles? Okay, so we're not thinking about switching from out, navigating outbound from Goose to inbound to to yay until about half of that so almost 100 miles so we got a ways to go alright anyway back to what we were doing so we get down to the next point here Deer Lake looks like this Victor 382 more or less takes us directly where we want to go from that point so let's just hop on that for a little bit to uh, Stevensville then it's a Victor 319 um, so yeah, are we going to take that all the way to the next VOR? No, we're not. We're going to take that just to this point, Yemeti. And then from Yemeti, we join this airway, the Tango 612, which in the U.S., a Tango route is RNAV only, but here, I mean, this is depicted in black, and there's radio nav stations at the end of it oh man okay 
I guess technically not a radio off of this a VOR. Although it's it's depicted in black, so that to me says that that's navigable by conventional means. Oh well, well we might be might be fudging it again just a little bit tonight too, guys. That's okay. Anyway, after you many, if we are indeed following this Tango Six Twelve, it would be to uh, what's it, Charlotte Town VOR. So we'll stick that down there and. Uh, Select that, Charlotte Town. And so obviously the Sky Vector says we can do Yumeti Tango 612, Charlotte's Town, but again, Sky Vector might be assuming that we're RNAV capable. And then after Charlotte Town, if we're going westbound to this VOR, which is the Moncton VOR, and then Moncton to the airport. Probably be on to an uh, instrument approach by the time we get over there. But anyway, that's the routing that I came up with. And again, it does add quite a bit of distance over that 460 some odd nautical mile direct path. But I figured we've done enough kind of fudging it. And with, you know, weather being questionable, especially at our destination, you know, we definitely want it to be more on a what would we say? proper IFR routing rather than kind of fudging it like we did. The other thing we, that happened when we were kind of fudging it was we probably clipped this airspace here, which I don't know. The CYR kind of tells you it's, it's Canadian restricted airspace. Um, don't really know much about it, but I think we did brush it. We were trying, trying to intercept this, an approximation of this path here. <clears throat> I think we were using a radial off of the Goose VOR to try and kind of come up with a path that would stay east of it. But I don't think we successfully did because, as I recall, and this has been a while. This has been probably last June or July. June or July like a year ago. A year and a half ago. Um, we, were, we were trying, we were kind of coming up this way. And we were trying to intercept this line and go north and west. But I don't think we were receiving that signal yet. So I think we kept going north and west. Until we eventually kind of intercepted it there, perhaps. I can't remember how it worked. Can't remember, but we definitely had issues with navigating on this leg. <clears throat> and we may well run into issues on this, too. Uh, we don't always have um, proper reception distance simulation in x on some of these longer radio nav legs so we'll just kind of have to see what happens so it's it's uh outbound on a 146 and again 193 so we're going 80 i'm sorry 97 miles basically 97 miles out from goose and then 97 miles in to uh to saint anthony so hopefully we'll still be receiving that signal 97 miles out how are we now we are still receiving it, and we're 72 miles out. Are we yet receiving the one that we're going inbound to? We are not. Actually, we, we could see that. I didn't have to flip the DME to see that. We could see that here. Just so we can kind of have a, a preview of it, what would be the correct inbound on that side? A 333 outbound. So what's that on the inbound side? A 153? Remember, we've talked about how these are not really straight lines. This is a 333, so a 153. And on this end, it was a what? A 146? A seven degree difference from one station to the next. And that's because, that's because this far north, especially, these rectangles here are not really rectangles. The farther north you go, I mean, these are starting to head towards the pole, right? Now, I've exaggerated it there, obviously. But eventually, you go far enough north that these things converge at a point. Called the North Pole. So that's why, you know, these what appear to be straight lines really aren't. But anyway, back to what I was saying. 333 says 153. So when we do get... Uh, 
when we do get over there. When we do start to receive that. Let's just go ahead and spin this over to a 153 so we can instantly see that we're receiving something and we'll instantly see how far off course again, especially because these aren't really straight lines. These radials may not match up exactly in the middle as you would expect them to. Slant Alpha Navigation, radio-based navigation, is very imprecise, especially over these longer distances. It's an imprecise navigation method. Just the nature of the beast. But it's part of what makes it challenging. Anomalous Propagation is back with us. How are you, Anomalous? Welcome. Hope that you're enjoying our enhanced skyscape. Let's do another outside shot, shall we? The Great White North, as they call it. Looking very great, but not so white. But yeah, it's pretty north. <laughs> Anomalous says I'm doing good. Thanks, good to hear that. Always enjoy your VATSIM control. I'm learning a lot about slant alpha flying now too. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is really honestly, it's more of a flying channel than a controlling channel. Although two days from now we'll be breaking that mold yet again. We're going to be down at our ZDC live event. We'll be broadcasting live from an undisclosed location in Roanoke, Virginia. Now, I have been forewarned, and I will forewarn you guys. Internet connectivity, where we're going to be at, may be questionable. I will do my best to broadcast. I, I cannot, at this point, promise it, but we'll see. The, I mean, the stream, especially, I, I, I broadcast it at 7.20 and 30 on purpose just to keep the bandwidth requirements down just a little bit um, so hopefully hopefully we'll be able to do that for you fingers crossed but it's our ZDC it's an annual ZDC live event so we're getting together with a bunch of our Washington ARTCC controllers we're staffing up all the majors in Washington uh, ARTCC facility so uh, Dulles BWI and DCA will all be staffed and uh, I guarantee you we'll see uh, some additional towers online as well. We'll have a good amount of staffing throughout the Potomac Tracon area, handful of center controllers, and probably a good number of our neighbors will be staffed up as well. So it'll be good good flying in the East Coast on Saturday evening. And uh, we've got the assignment of Dulles International Airport Tower, Dulles Tower. So not our normal uh, DCA, but uh, we got nice big long three parallel runways and a, and a fourth runway to launch planes off on. So little bit of a less stressful engagement than uh, than what we often get. So yes, yeah, Smitty, that's Saturday. Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, midnight Zulu time on Sunday morning. So that's why you got us on. Uh, you got us. Well, you, you missed us last night because I had a Maryland basketball game to watch, but we're on tonight, and then we're off tomorrow because we're on Saturday instead. So switching the schedule up, we normally fly for you. We normally broadcast for you Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. Uh, off schedule this week due to uh, sports commitments and then uh, the ZDC live event. Oh, I just saw. I don't know if you do, I know if you guys noticed, but down here the, the VOR2 is now receiving. So that's good. This airway uh, does, at least in the X plane does have enough reception range to, to navigate it the way it should be. Now you'll also notice that it's showing us a little left, uh, right of course. It's showing that we need to correct it over to the left to get on there. Again, the radials don't match up perfectly. That could be the way it is in the real life on this airway. That could be just a, a slight inaccuracy in the sim and the magnetic deviation table might be out of date, who knows? These airways might match up a little bit better in the real world than they do here in the sim. 
but uh, but yeah, it's again just part of the imprecision, the inherent imprecision in this type of navigation. I guess if we're going through some more clouds here, I just just to not feel nervous about it. Now this is de-icing, not anti-icing. So really, you would use a de-icer if you had visible ice buildup. But I don't, I don't think anti-icing capabilities are fully modeled in this aircraft. So we kind of consider them one and the same here for sim purposes. The other thing is, uh, I don't think the in this aircraft. I think that in the DC-6, the PMDG DC-6 for uh, flights in 2020. You know, does model these de-icing or anti-anti-icing and de-icing fluid levels, so you can run out of de-icing fluid and anti-icing fluid in that DC-6. Don't think that's modeled in this aircraft. I think you can pretty much leave them on uh, with impunity. But I try to, you know, semi-realistically turn them off when I don't think they're needed, just to uh, just to conserve their use. As I, as I guess I would if I was flying this thing for real. Alright, so coming up on that halfway point, guys, what we'll do is we'll uh, waggle that back and forth. Yep, we're pretty much halfway. Let's go ahead and before we do anything... Oh, you know what happened, guys? J exactly what I said would happen, happened. We've now run the right main all the way down to 130. So now let's, or yeah, the left main all the way down to 130. So let's run both tanks off the right main for a little bit. I knew it. Damn it. I knew it. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll refix the balance again. <laughs> In the meantime... Let's go ahead and resync our headings. So that shows that we're heading on a 155 to a 156. We'll make that match. And then we'll make that match. Not really flying off of... Uh, not really flying off of the heading heading control right now, but I'm spin that around to make that match as well. All right, let's see how everything shakes out. We'll wait till the plane decides it's pointing in at uh, the direction it wants to point in, and wait for all the directional gyros and and uh, indicators to settle in. We'll check those again. So there now is a one five three, I guess. That's showing more like a 152. I guess that's a 153. Yeah, and then this is, uh, yeah, it's about a 153 also. All right, so while we're fiddling with the radios, let's go ahead and swap into heading mode so the plane doesn't start to spin around and chase needles for no good reason. Let's go ahead and swap the station we're tracking on NAV 2 up into NAV 1. Again, no, uh, there's no automated swap button in these radios. We'll just tune it ourselves. We see now that we have the RMI that's pointing us in the right direction. We can see that directly to it is a 150, but we're going to need to correct a little bit to the right to uh, to track that um, with the wind correction. However, we'll also see that we do need to correct a little bit to the left because the airways didn't line up perfectly like we were talking about earlier. So what I'm going to do now while we remain in heading mode. Now I could just pop it in the nav mode. The aircraft will kind of shake those corrections out for us. Uh, not a big deal here, but I'm gonna just, just put in about a 10 degree correction. You know, this far out, 90 miles out, probably need a, a little bit more than a 10 degree correction. Maybe we'll do 20. When you're that far out, you need kind of a more aggressive correction to make the needle move. Because, you know, the, this distance, the angle doesn't change much, really.
Oh, well, I'll tell you what, and before before we pop it into nav mode, we would need to set the correct radial on the uh, the VOR1 anyway. And that was what we said was a 153, because the chart said 333, but we're coming inbound. So there's 150, and we'll go 1, 2, 3. Okay, so we got a little bit of a left correction. I feel like these are maybe like a degree off from each other as well. Because that's only showing half a dot deflection. That's showing a full dot deflection. So I feel like these these don't line up perfectly either. And again, that's just that, that's that's part of part of slant alpha navigation, man. Does look like they are coming back into center though. Our correction is working out the way we want it. Nice gentle correction back on the center. I'm gonna go ahead and wait for that to uh to come more more fully into the center and then we'll pop that back into nav mode and let auto track that in for us. Meantime, we can get our next navigation step ready. We're gonna go into San Anthony from the north and west here to the south and east. We're then gonna go outbound on this 224 and the next station down the line is what? Good chunk down the line, but it's Deer Lake on 13.3. So we'll go ahead and get 13.3 tuned in. We went from 17.3 to 13.7 to 13.3. And again, I think that that correlation is kind of done on purpose. And then 13.3, we said we're going to come into on what? A 0.36, so that's a 2.16. So again, even though it's very premature, we'll just set a 216 just to have it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Not yet receiving it. We can see by the red flags there. We can see by the DME being zero there. But we're ready to go when we get a little closer. And in the meantime, that's come right back nice into center, so we'll just pop that back into nav mode and let auto take care of the rest of that force. Yeah, again, auto, we overshot just, just a hair, but the autopilot's going to go into this 30-degree bank to go correct that for us, which we greatly appreciate, auto. Thanks. Meantime, I'm just going to turn the heading back to about a 150-ish. doesn't really matter. Presumably, once that minuscule little deviation gets settled out, we'll turn back toward a 160, 155 ish to uh, intercept and hold. Again, you would think that it would be whatever the yellow arrow points to. In reality, it's whatever the yellow arrow points to, plus or minus the wind correction. Seventy-nine miles and inbound. All right, now let's. Now that we've got some time to devote to other things, let's think and take another spin through the engine gauges here. We got 20, uh, 23. 23 and 34. Cylinder attempts looking good. All the temps and pressures looking good. And then let's just let's just try to keep better tabs since I've completely screwed up the fuel balance like I knew I would. Left mains at 135, right mains at 150. So we literally only have 15 gallons to go. And then we'll switch over to the aux tanks and run them down all the way. So, 15 gallons. What does this thing burn? An hour? hundred gallons an hour? So, 15 minutes? So, by 8.25, we should be... Uh, 8.25, we should be balanced. We'll see how well that shakes out. Whoops. Oh, 
Oh, and by the way, I, I, you know, I always say, you know, I don't like to look at the, the uh, progress bar up top. I say that more when we're doing, you know, kind of dead reckoning or VFR navigation. IFR, I don't mind as much knowing what the progress bar says because I know where I am. I don't have any, I don't have any doubts. VFR, when we're navigating just off the visual landmarks, all the lakes and rivers kind of look the same, roads kind of look the same. You're not 100% sure you're looking at what you think you are. You know, when I know I'm on an X such and such radial off of X such and such station at X such and such distance, I know where I am. So the progress bar isn't as secret information to me as it, it would be on a VFR or a dead reckoning flight. But what I'll tell you is, and what I was about to say is, notice that you know, on the first part of this flight, until we get out to uh, St. Anthony, we're not really tracking toward our destination much. That progress bar, nice little tool, but it doesn't know this whole route that we're taking. All it knows is the straight line distance to the uh, destination. So the straight line distance hasn't changed. Matter of fact, it might have even gotten slightly more distant as we're making our way south and east. But as soon as we make this turn in towards St. Anthony, the estimates on that progress bar should start to make a little bit more sense. So I don't know what it's showing. I haven't looked. I don't see that. That's not on my SIM screen. That's added between my SIM screen and the broadcast. So I don't see that. But I can, I can almost guarantee you that it's not making much sense. But it will start to make more sense once we turn south and westbound from St. Anthony. I know I said that the fuel was going to need to run until 825 in that jacked up configuration. But just to make sure. Well, it looks like about 10 to 11 more minutes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I said. Okay. Alright, well, I will uh, keep, I keep doing that. Sorry, guys. I will keep that in mind, and uh, I, you know, a good pilot would maybe set an alarm. <laughs> well, a, a, a truly good pilot would have somebody sitting in the right seat managing that for us. You know, Miss Freckles decided not to come along tonight, and uh, you know, she's not really helpful anyway when she flies along with us. So, but anyway, it's all good. Given that we've got... Finger licking good. Yeah, it is indeed finger licking good. Freckles doesn't have a passport. I don't know if she does or doesn't get fixings. I would have been willing to overlook it anyway. But, like I said, she's not a lot of help. She doesn't know her way around the cockpit, that's for sure. Anyway, 64 miles, counting down. And, uh, like I said, still got a few minutes to run the fuel balance correction configuration. So, I think that's my cue to take a quick break out of the cockpit. feel like I should leave it in this view until I get back so I don't forget to, to, to address it. But, I don't want to do that to you guys. I keep doing that, though. I don't mean to do that, either. I don't want to do that to you guys. I'll let you guys kind of watch the groundscape and the skyscape as it passes us by. I guess just preventatively go ahead and turn the de-icing on while I'm away, just in case. Right, but I am going to take just a couple minutes out, guys. We'll be back with you with lots of flying left to do. We're going Goose Bay, Canada, all the way down to Moncton. And again, we'll start showing some progress on that progress bar once we make our turn at St. Anthony to head kind of in a more direct path there. So we we'll be back with you in just a bit. Appreciate you flying along on the Slant Alpha channel, guys. Sit tight.
I was back with you and cruising along. I noticed that we're not dead yet, which is always good news. I'm not dead yet. I feel happy. Go ahead and turn the de-icing off again. In this aircraft, there's no real detriment to just leaving it on, but you know, realistically, you would be wanting to conserve your heating elements or your fluid or your Um, your your air bleeds off the off the engine, whatever reason, whatever type of the of the icing or anti icing it is, you you, you would ordinarily only want to run it when you're actually going to need it. So uh, so yeah, we'll do our best. And again, nice clear air like this, we should be okay. Um, I'm. I've been told conflicting things about the dangers of icing at negative 20, but it looks like the outside air temp has actually gotten a little bit warmer. Closer to negative 10, certainly it's closer to a uh, concern. I've, I've always been told the range is 10, you know, 10 to negative 10 is where you got to really watch out for it. But, but again, I've been told conflicting things about where we're sitting right now. But certainly, with the moisture around, we want to be vigilant. Probably just err on the side of safety and certainly if we see our indicated airspeed start to drop off with no explanation in terms of engine power output yeah we would want to take that as a sign that we're picking up some icing either in the wings either we're losing lift and the planes compensating by uh, pitching up and losing airspeed that way or the propellers themselves are picking up ice and not able to generate as much thrust and we're losing airspeed that way. One of those two situations would be happening. Neither of them would be terribly wonderful things. All right, well, we, we did exactly what we just added to the channel memes list earlier this week. And we screwed up the fuel. The, the, the minor fuel balance has become a major fuel. Um, the minor fuel balance issue has become a major fuel balance issue because I tend to obsess over. Okay, so now the right main is a little bit lighter, so we'll run both engines off of the left main for just like a couple of minutes. And then as soon as we're back into balance. We'll switch over to the aux tanks, and the aux tanks are nice and balanced because I haven't touched those yet. I haven't had an opportunity to screw those up yet. So those are nice and balanced at nearly full, about 190 gallons each, 100 and maybe 89 gallons is what seems to be showing on the gauge there. So again, the right main is hovering just over 130, the left main, we'll wait until it gets down to that same mark and then we'll switch over. The V-Skylabs models icing. I had the windows fully freeze on me once. That's good fixings. Yeah, I keep hearing good things about that updated V-Skylabs. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so hesitant to spend too much money, too much more money on anything X-Plane because I, I do love the, the, the external visuals of that of uh, Flights in 2020. But it just seems like development... You know, development seems to have stalled on that aeroplane heaven... DC-3 for flights in 2020. And, you know, X-Plane 12 is coming out soon, so, you know, X-Plane certainly hasn't, you know, given up the boat here. I don't know, man. Maybe maybe I ought to just bite the bullet and get that V-Sky Labs. I, I thought that the, the, the cockpit of the V-Sky Labs looked a little bit too default to me, but that was before the, the recent update, the update that came out within the last, what was it, month or two? So, I keep, I keep wavering back and forth as to whether I'm going to whether I'm going to take the plunge there. Pentagon has checked back in. Pentagon, how are you? Welcome back. I've flown that all the way across the U.S. Says good fixings, and I don't know if it's worth it. Honestly, the ground handling is wonky. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. We got a few friends on the channel that that swear by it. I mean, everyone's everyone has their own priorities, right? Everyone's got their own little piece that they're like, well, this is what's most important to me. So, I mean, the thing to do is probably not that much money. The thing to do is probably just to buy it and make my own decision. All right, let's, uh... All right, those are pretty pretty darn close to perfectly balanced now. After all that, we're what? We're only an hour and a half into the stream. I finally fixed the fuel balance. 
Let's go ahead and switch over to the aux tanks then, right? So I can screw that up. Right aux goes to the right engine. Left aux goes to the left engine, and let's be done with it. Pentagon says, I feel exactly like you about my purchases right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I really do want... I want... If I had my wish... I want Microsoft Flight Sim to be the sim of the future. Yeah, X-Plane 11 planes will probably be compatible, says Good Fixins. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. The only reason I would stop spending money on X-Plane entirely is if I didn't plan on flying X-Plane 11 or 12 in the future. The one thing that gives me pause, Good Fixins, is that X-Plane continues to push the design philosophy of uh, land class and um, you know a data driven approach to uh, scenery rather than a uh, photographic approach to scenery. The complete exact opposite mindset that Microsoft Flight Sim is built on. And, and we can see the difference, right? I mean, Flight Sim 2020 externally looks great. That stream that I did on Monday with the um, the VAT USA Friday Night Hotspot FNO preview where we, we flew the uh, CJ4 into Los Angeles. I got to that downwind leg uh, where uh, on the Ironman where I was right over downtown. Man, it was stunning looking. Just gorgeous. And X-Plane 11 with Ortho looks good, but just, just not quite as good. Just, you look at it and you go, eh. That's pretty good for X-Plane, you know? <laughs> so, I really want Flight Sim 2020 to be the sim of the future. It's just... It's just taken forever to for developers to get their products up and running, and I think it's just because the platform itself is still so much of a moving target. You know, X-Plane... Has, is, is, I mean, you know, obviously the... The new versions get deeper and deeper, and you know, new things, and they do they do new th you know old 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 things new ways for sure. But uh, but X Plane as a platform, as a development platform, just probably probably much more stable than Flight Sim 2020, which every sim update tends to break something in some add-on in Flight Sim 2020. So I know that's got to be frustrating for the folks that are still working on stuff that they haven't released and all of a sudden they got to go back to the drawing board with pieces of it every time the sim update comes out so i get it but i just want i want that sim to be good because it's so it looks like visually it just looks so good the camera controls are indeed terrible good fixings i give you that too it will be yeah Eric says it will be. I think it will be too, but it's just it's just seems like it's moving at a snail's pace. And I know everything flights in flights in development. I've 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 always said flights in development it always takes three times as long as you think it will. And it's always ten times more complex than you think it is. But I just feel like with flights in 2020, you can multiply that by a factor of two or three, which just adds to it. Smitty says, I just decided to go crazy cooking ortho, but it's it's not near flight sim quality. Flight sim 20, yeah, fl Microsoft flight sim quality. No, exactly. I mean, I, I have ortho most of the places I fly, and it does, at altitude, it looks pretty darn good. Down low, though, on approach, it's, like I said, I mean, that, that moment, Rob Valkyrie is here, that moment over LA on that downwind on Monday, really spelled it out for me like I knew inherently that on approach is where on approach over populated areas that's where flights in 2020 really shines scenery wise you know medium altitudes mid to low altitudes over over populated areas that's where you can really tell the difference between the two sims but uh But yeah, it's just it's just such a work in progress. It's just so frustrating at times. Friend to all says, 
You all make valid points, and since I'm more of a casual pilot, I love flights in 2020 doing all of the heavy lifting for scenery. X-Plane was a nightmare for configuring as well as managing the global maps. And global maps, and yes, and then if you're into cooking ortho tiles, that's a whole, you know, cook, <laughs> creating ortho scenery is its own learning process, completely separate from the sim, so... Good Fixins went into Hawaii, Hilo, Hawaii last night in X-Plane at sunset with the ortho. And it was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, so that I, I tell you what, the, 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 the terrain looks just as good in either sim. It's it's flying low over those populated areas where flights in 2020 just can't be touched. Unless you have something, you know, something quality payware like uh like Warbix or whatever. Yeah, and Hawaii is just... I mean, Hawaii is just... Hawaii is hard not to be gorgeous, right? You'd really have to mess up Hawaii. Hawaii looked good in Flight Sim 9. I mean... <laughs> you know, Hawaii is... That's a joke. I mean, it's not completely a joke, but you know what I'm saying. But... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can go back pretty far. I, you know, flights in nine may be pushing it, but you can go back pretty far, and Hawaii still look pretty darn good because Hawaii just is Hawaii. But yeah, you know, but it's it's those low approaches over the populated areas where it, it really just it's really just incomparable. The fauna is way better in flights in. Ah, oh, that. Uh, eh, okay more stuff for you to hit, I guess. <laughs> Alright, where are we? 11 miles. Go to eleven. Yeah, weather and clouds are getting better in flights in twenty twenty. Says friend to all. Now I'll tell you what though. Something happened in that last update. They were trying to integrate more current METAR observations in. Whatever they did, those transitions. Was it? It was the last time we were flying the Mooney, which I think was up in the Boston area. Was that when we did? Um, we did that Plymouth event. And uh, the, the transitions as we were south of Bradley headed north, we got we got off course because I'm an idiot and can't read gauges. Um, but as we were correcting our course into Bradley, we it felt like we had two mid-airs with the insane uh, wind transitions. So something happened in that most recent sim update, and they put it out as a uh, as a feature, saying, "Oh, we're we're doing better when it comes to incorporating current METAR observations into the weather simulation." Yeah, but you can't slam into them like that. So, you know, one step forward, one step back. I guess is kind of always the way with them. Um, before we make any kind of a navigation transition. Let's run through the gauges here and make sure that they all agree on which way we're pointing. That's a 160 exactly. That's a 155, it says. And that's a 155. So these do drift out of sync gradually over time, and you, you have to occasionally kind of just correct them back into one another. I don't... I mean, I, we're tracking an, a radio beam, so I don't know why the plane feels the need to correct itself when we do that in nav mode at least so uh, that might be just a little bit of an inaccuracy in the uh, avionics but let's see did it all shake out to where they all agree now 155 on the nose 155 on the nose and then the, the bottom half of this gauge also a 155 on the nose top half of the gauge we're not really using right now but we can make them all match if we want okay so 155's all around good uh, we are 
just to remind ourselves three and a half miles from the turn here and this is the point where we're going to actually start making progress toward our destination uh, in a more traditional sense here we're going to be flying a 224 outbound so we're going to making a pretty almost a 90 degree like about an 80 degree right turn there oh, and the plane started without us huh uh, the plane's trying to correct back onto that radial which we're only tracking for another two and a half miles. Um, let's just go ahead and put it into heading mode. So we will manually affect that turn. Now remember, you know, we're at 6,000, we're at 8,000 feet, so we're more than a mile above this VOR. So it's not going to count all the way down to zero then, is it? And within a mile, I think we could probably just go ahead and start making that right turn. I'm just going to gradually turn that knob up to about a 2.4 two is what we said, is what we're going to track on the outbound side. I probably cut the turn a little too early, so we'll turn not quite to a 2-2, we'll turn to a 2-1 just for the moment. Go ahead and set the 2-2-4 here, just so we know what we're shooting for. Uh, whoop, did I turn too late? I turned way too late. So there's 2-20. 1, 2, 3, 4, okay. Yeah, turn turn later or and or more gradually than I thought I did or intended to. So we'll just set it up to a 240 here just for now. Reintercept that course that's that we're heading outbound from. Again, we're pretty close into the VOR, so a 20 degree correction ought to be more than plenty. It probably will swing back in pretty quickly, actually. Since we got all kinds of time on the stream, I'll maybe illustrate that. You know, why do we say you can make a less radical correction closer in? Oh, Rob and Good Fixins are talking about wreck. Yeah, I saw a screenshot. <laughs> I'll show you. I, I gotta find it. And uh, I think it's in the ZDC Discord. One of our one of my ZDC colleagues was flying something, and the. Uh, the temperature at cruise was like literally 500 uh, centigrade. Oh, I gotta find it. Get, bear with me on that. Uh, so we pop this back into nav mode. The plane will automatically now track that that 224, whatever it was I said. Yeah, 224. The next leg, do we know the distance? 137. I guess that's 137. There's no other intermediate points along the way. Well, if we take out the airway, if we if we tell it that instead of Victor 381, we're just going direct. Same thing in this case. But now Sky Vector should tell us the length of that leg. Yeah, 137. So we'll, we'll say 70 miles out, 70 miles in, minus a little bit. So we're tracking that 224. We're not yet receiving anything on NAV 2, but we're outbound on a 224 on NAV 1. And so things are good. If we want just a cross check of our position ahead, uh, no, we don't have an NDB at the one ahead of us. So. We'll just leave that. So never mind. Never mind that part. No. Never mind that. Never mind that now. Never mind that now. No, no. This sucker, sucker's electrical. <laughs> All right. Um, so Rob had said... Flight sim weather, and even with Rex weather force, there's... An issue with the 
inaccuracy of temperatures at cruise altitude. Yeah, let me find that screenshot. So here it is. Yeah, so, so static air temperature 468, true air temperature 500. <laughs> this was not the space shuttle, by the way. He was not in re-entry mode. <laughs> oh well. Alright, uh, engine gauge is all looking good. Cylinder head temps looking good, yeah. Let's see how we're doing with our fuel. So left and right main should be parked at about 130 gallons, right aux and left aux should be balanced, 180 counting down, okay, we're good. Yeah, do a little cooking up there. <laughs> and what was the other point that I was going to make? Oh, we were talking about navigation transitions and why. I always say that if you correct close into a VOR, We're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna do two, two lines for comparison. All right. So we flew in this way, and let's just. I don't know exactly how it shook out. Let's just say we passed over the VOR, and I, I turned late, and I wound up paralleling the path that I intended to take. Well, I'll tell you what. Zoom that out just a little bit. You, you are, yeah, you are, at that point, you are the in-flight meal, that's right. You're the, you're the frog in the, uh, you're the frog in, in the, in the pot, or whatever, I forget how that saying goes. Alright, so we've overshot the turn, and now we're turned to a 224, but we've wound up past We've wound up east of our intended southwest course, okay? So we're flying the 224, but we're, we're not tracking the course. If we make the correction down yeah, up here, if we make the correction close to the VOR, all it really needs to be is about a 20 degree correction. And it puts us, all right, well, that's a bad example. The boiled frog, yeah, that's, that's the one. The, the boiled frog and the princess. I don't know how this stuff goes. Alright, let's try it this way, guys. We come up to the VOR. We turn, but we don't turn enough. So now the further away we get, the more off course we get. If we make the correction soon, we don't have to turn that radically to get back on course. If we make the correction late, a, a, a general correction takes us a long time to get back on course. Whereas, you know, we make this correction later out, you know, we, we need to make a steeper correction to get back over there. Does that make sense? When you're talking about angles, okay, talking about the difference of this angle, that's what your, your gauge is showing you. The deviation gauge is showing you a difference in the angle, not a difference in the distance off course that you are. So this gauge here, 
If that's showing one degree of deviation... Obviously, that's more like five degrees of deviation, but you get the point. One degree of deviation at this distance. You know, might only be a quarter of a mile off course. One degree of deviation at this distance might be, might be a whole mile off course. The farther away you go, that one degree difference is, is, a, is a larger deviation. So that's why I always say if you're close in, don't worry about making like a 90 degree correction to get back on. If you're farther away, then you can make that 90 degree correction, or maybe not 90 degree, but you know, make a 40 or 50 degree correction and get back on. Whereas down here, you can make a 10 degree correction, just nice, nice and smooth or rejoin. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. I don't know. You guys aren't paying attention. We're, talking, we're busy talking about frogs. I'm, I'm mixing up all my frog metaphors. And I have you guys all distracted now. <laughs> Where are we with it? Okay, so I did turn the anti-icing off. Looks like we're okay for now. We're in fairly clear air. Eh, a little bit of a texture issue going on there. I don't think that's intended. I think that's just a little bit of a texture issue. Rob's paying attention. Good. Well, there will be a quiz, Rob, so good thing. Yeah, I don't think that's supposed to be a weather phenomenon. I think that's just a little bit of texture fighting there. And that, that the, uh, the, uh, the Skyscapes developer does say in his literature, he's like, yeah, you know, these, these clouds look nice, nicer than the default 2D ones, but there are some issues. It's not perfect. It's a pretty affordable add-on, so for... I, I'm, for my money, I think it's great. But they do say in their site there are little issues like that. The Disney princess boiled the frog? Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Rob, there you go, God. There you go, Rob. There you go. You get an A. You get an A. You get an A. You get an A. <laughs> Good fixings. He got all confused. He boiled the toad instead. Okay. V O R. Very off route. A good correction makes you a good angler. That's right, Anomalous. Now we're getting it. All right, how are we doing? Speaking of uh, being on or off route. Okay, yep, so we are receiving that next station down the line. 106 and 30. We did say it was 137 mile leg, so that's bearing out to be correct. We can see that it's not exactly dead on. We talked earlier about how sometimes these these things that are charted as straight lines are not really a 224. You would expect to be a 044 on the other end, but it's not. It's a 036. That one's eight full degrees off. The farther north you go, you know, the more of a potential these have to be a little different one side to the other because the farther north you go, the more these rectangles are not really rectangles. They do taper towards each other at the top. We're going to get into uh, Pythagoras, Smitty. Well, we talked earlier. I don't know if you were here. We're talking earlier about how these rectangles are not really rectangles. Did you catch that discussion? I've I'll go over it again for you. I mean, these... These rectangles... And I, I can't draw straight lines for crap with this tool, so I apologize for that. In reality, they... Whoops. <laughs> they don't taper quite in that far. <laughs> but they do taper in at the top, because the farther north you go, the closer you get to the point where these all converge. Right? 
So that's why these 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 uh, lines that appear straight on maps are not straight. But in this case, you can see that radial being eight degrees off on the other side because we're so far north, and and that that curvature effect really has a uh, really has a pronounced impact here on the navigation. Smitty's been in the kitchen cooking up his frog legs. Okay, gotcha. Okay, no, no worries, no worries. Rob Valkyrie will pass the quiz. Smitty, I guess you, you might have to retake it. That's all good, though. But anyway, yeah, so we'll notice, and we noticed earlier, you know, that it might, you know, we might be a little closer to centered when these two meet in the middle, when we're about 70 miles from each. That might be better, or it might be worse. We noticed that the uh, the radials didn't line up very well in the sim at all on the last transition we made. And again, that could be reality, or that could be a sim uh, variance in the magnetic variation being accurately represented, something like that. But again, it, it just goes to the overall imprecision of... Uh, Navigation through radio based uh, methods here. GPSs are cool, cool devices. But, you know, they, they've been flying planes for over 100 years. The GPSs have been around for, well, substantially less than half of that. It is the Aeroworks Douglas DC-3 for X-Plane 11. Again, we were talking earlier about the pros and cons, the X-Plane 11 cons and the pros and cons versus Flight Sim 2020. The good, the big pro in uh, X-Plane is we've got a good DC-3 for it. We've got a hand, well, we've got multiple. we got actually several really good DC-3s for X-Plane 11. We were talking about that earlier. Don't have a good DC-3 yet for flights in 2020, with all that we do have that awesome DC-6 by PMDG, which we fly on this channel a fair amount. Those of you new to the stream, we do fly a mixture of X-Plane 11 and Flight Sim 2020 on this stream. I think probably a little bit more than half the time we're in Flight Sim 2020, maybe, maybe approaching two-thirds of the time now we're in Flight Sim 2020 that we may even skew a little bit more that way after we wrap up this series. This series, by the way, again, for those of you who aren't uh, up to date with what we've been doing, this series is a uh, long-standing mini-series within the stream. A couple times a month, we knock out a couple more legs of this, what's coming up on a two-year tour now that started in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, eastern eastern coast, Atlantic coast of the uh, mid-Atlantic area of the United States, which is area that I call home in the real world. We started it uh, kind of coming through some moisture here. We'll go ahead and get the anti-icing stuff back on. Um, started here uh, at uh, Martin State Airport, which is just east of the city of Baltimore. It is a... Uh, civilian, executive, and military mixed-use airfield just east of the city. And it's the airport that I call my virtual home. I've done some plane spotting over there from time to time. I've even visited the tower cab over there pre-9-11. But we started that, this, this uh, long-standing adventure over in uh, over at Martin State, and uh, the idea was to take this plane on a tour of the Mediterranean. Decided to do a, a, a circle around 
the uh, Mediterranean Coastal and Island Airports, some really cool picturesque sites. And I was like, you know what would be fun? Why don't we start and end in Baltimore? And we'll take this thing up in a series of hops across the uh, eastern, northeastern part of Canada. We'll hop across into Greenland and then Iceland. And then, you know, I plotted this, this whole big, long route that, that came down through the Faroe Islands and then the UK and then down you know, kind of toward, uh, kind of across mainland Europe to Gibraltar. And then we did a, a pretty comprehensive tour. I mean, we didn't stop everywhere at every airport, but we, we stopped at several dozen airports between Gibraltar and I guess what's the easternmost one that we did? Castellarisos, maybe? Castellarisos, Greece, right off of the uh, Turkish coast, and then up through the Aegean, and then back into mainland Europe through Italy, Austria, Germany, and then... Uh, the Netherlands back to the UK and then kind of coming back up and over the North Atlantic the same way we came and we're just about wrapped up that uh, that tour again this is the, what this is the 31st episode I think this is episode number 31 of this series that we call Douglas Overseas leg number 54 so at least a couple of these you know, longer legs at the beginning and the end of the tour, we did one leg per stream. We have done as many as, I think, five legs per stream. Is that right? Is that, is that the most? Is five? Yeah, episode 20 was five legs. Yes, that's, yeah, I guess that's the most. I guess the majority of them have been two legs. We've done a few four leg trips. Handful of three leg trips. But yeah, after tonight, we're going from Goose Bay to Moncton in uh, northeastern Canada tonight. After tonight, we've got two more episodes to wrap up this tour. We're going to do another one toward the, uh, the mid to late part of December, and then we're going to do our finale of uh, Douglas Overseas on New Year's Day. January 1st, 2022 will be episode number 33 as we wrap up legs 56 and 57, we'll fly from uh, Portland, Maine, down to Danbury, Connecticut. We'll take one more stab at that uh, that uh, Death Star Trench approach to runway 35 at uh, Danbury. Hopefully, won't slam it onto the pavement like I did when we did our very first Douglas Overseas episode. And then we'll make that final trip down from Danbury, Connecticut, to Martin State Airport in Baltimore. And we'll wrap that up. Now, keep keep in mind, guys, even if you weren't around, this tour started in March of 2020. That, that should be a familiar month to you. March of 2020 should stand out in your minds. So many reasons, good and bad, mostly bad. <laughs> but that's when we started this tour, right toward the end of March 2020. And so think about all the ways that the world was different at that point, but think about the ways that the stream was different at that point. A year and uh, just about nine months ago. It'll be just over a year and nine months by the time we finish it up. Eastern 21, Eddie Rickenbacker, the CEO of Eastern that uh, on that flight that crashed. That was in March of 2020? <laughs> no, but anyway, keep, uh, keep, keep in your mind the various ways the world was different, the various ways the stream was different. This will, that'll be a topic of conversation on that New Year's Day stream as we wrap up this tour. And we'll probably have some probably have some giveaways associated with things like that that were uh, things that were the were different about the stream. Okay, so that was a little bit before we started this tour. <laughs> I know, Smitty. We're talking about two things at the same time. It's all good. <clears throat>
but yeah, it's been a wild ride. It's a, the, the, the uh, like I said, it's been a wild ride just for all of us, I think, since March of 2020. But the 31 episodes of this tour, and then 33 by the time we're all done, have been quite the wild ride. We've had we've we've visited a lot of awesome places. We've had some really cool adventures. I am glad that I did the tour. The one thing that I learned, the one biggest thing that I learned, is that uh, is that non Arnav IFR flying in Europe <laughs> is is almost not possible at this point. So we had quite a number of streams where we weren't really VFR, but we weren't really IFR. And I think that was one of the reasons I decided tonight not to fudge it, and just, even though it added another 250 miles, I, I didn't want to kind of just come straight down here because, you know, again, weather conditions aren't really going to be VMC. So I was like, well, and it's going to add another hour to the stream tonight, but we'll do a, we'll do a legit IFR route since we can. And, by the way, I think we're coming up on that transition to where we should start navigating inbound to Deer Lake. You always want to make those transitions at the halfway point. We were talking earlier about the lateral off course that happens just naturally because of the inherent inaccuracy in this type of navigation. So the further out you are, and again, drawing the angles exaggerated on purpose, especially because it's very difficult to draw straight lines in this tool. Um, but the farther out you are, the more off course you could potentially be. Now imagine those narrower than that. But if you change over at the halfway point, then that's a, the worst off course laterally that you're going to be. And then as you get closer to the station you're navigating toward, the amount off course that you are laterally will diminish. So if you're getting further away from the station, you're getting more off course. If you're getting closer to a station, you're potentially getting less off course. So that's why you always want to navigate to that halfway point and then switch over unless there's a marking on the chart that tells you otherwise. Marking on the chart occasionally tells you otherwise because of things like signal strength or interference or you know other, other reasons that uh, it's navigationally advantageous to switch at a different place than halfway. The other thing that you have to do, if you're on a leg like this, where we're not navigating all the way to the next station down the line, obviously the point it was since you can only navigate directly toward or directly away from a VOR properly, you know, we have to change at this bend in the road because we don't have a choice. We're going straight out from this VOR until the point that we're not, and then we're going straight into this VOR. We actually might be, well, we're probably pretty much at the halfway point there, so we'll just go straight into that VOR. But anyway, so that's one of the, that's one of the other exceptions is you've got to bend in the road. You've got to change over at that point because there's, there's just really, there's no other true real way to navigate a VOR. You could navigate an arc, I guess. DME arc is a different different method of navigation if you constantly stay 20 miles away or whatever, but that's not usually done in on-route navigation. That would be done in more in terms of an approach uh, usually. Alright, anyway. So what did I say? We're switching over. 68. Uh, oh, so I hit it right there. Right there at the halfway point for, for dead, dead certain. And, and again, those radials don't line up the way they ought to. That's that could be realistic or it could be a sim issue. Either way, it's not that big a deal. We're just going to correct and scooch ourselves over. Um, let's Before we make any navigation transitions, let's just line up the headings, make sure they all agree with what the direction we're pointed. That's reading at 2, 2, 4 maybe? 2.24. And yeah, so we're about 4 degrees, 5 degrees off there, 5 degrees off there. Scoop that up to about a 224. Scoop that up to about a 224. Again, we can go ahead and match that up since we're about to change over into heading mode. Before we do that, let's just let it all settle in, decide what direction it's pointed. Let's see if the gauges all agree. And we have, 
Yeah, we got the anti-icing stuff on, okay. Alright, are we stable? That's a 2-2. I guess that's now a 2-2-3. Two, two, uh, let's bump that up one. Bump that up one. Alright, let's give it another give it another minute. Let it <clears throat> let it shake out, settle in. Decide what direction it wants to go. Now at this point we're <laughs> At this point, we're well past the halfway point. We're now 72 miles from the one behind us, 64 miles from the one in front of us. So we really should have started this process a little earlier. But I was yammering on, not paying attention, trying to teach you guys something. 2-2, um, 2-2-2 two, 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 or 2-2-3 two, two, thereabouts. Okay, that's good. Uh, that's good. All right, anyway. We'll pop it into heading mode. So we got the heading, the, the, yeah, the desired, desired headings matched up. So we pop it into heading mode, keep the plane pointed in the direction that it's pointed. And again, we've got to manually swap what we're navigating to in NAV2 up to NAV1. So 13.7 becomes 13.3. All right, there we go. 61 miles and counting down, and then we got to reset the correct radial. Inbound now to 13.3 on a 036. So that would be a, what is that? A 036 would be what? A 216, is that what we said? Yeah, so it's well left of, so there's a 220. 19, 18, 17, 16, okay. So we still need to correct to the left here. And again, we're 50, 60 miles out. So with that, that far off, I mean, four degrees off, right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, so we're four miles laterally off course here. So let's go with a pretty substantial correction. Let's go ahead and put in, let's see, there's a 220. Uh, we need to correct left. So, uh, 10, 20, 30 degrees. So now I'm navigating inbound to Deer Lake. After we pass Deer Lake, it'll be this 254 outbound. And then what's the next station in? 13-1. We'll go ahead and get that set up. Just to have that preset and ready to go. Again, just really, I mean, there's no swap. There's no swap button, so it doesn't really help you that much. But it is good information to have as far as are we in fact receiving that station. Looks like we already are. Oh, that's good. So yeah, that and that leg is not that far. It looks like... Total leg there, 45 and 25, so that's only 70 miles there. So that one's a little shorter, but when we are inbound to that, it'll be on a 074, so we can go ahead and get that set on a 254. And again, we're not going to be on that right now, but when we switch over to it, hopefully we'll be a little closer. 25. One, two, three, four. Anyway, right now we're inbound to the one before it. We're inbound to what will we call, call that? Deer Lake. Inbound to Deer Lake on that two one six, aka zero three six. Have we gotten back onto that zero three six yet? No, we're working on it. Melvin Leroy is here. Oh my goodness, Melvin Leroy. How are you, sir? 
slanta can 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 slanta who can catch sunrise? Da, 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 da. The Slanta Man can. <laughs> I, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it's that kind of night, no, but I'm. I'm a little loopy. I'm not. I'm not even Richard Peak tonight. Just, just a little, little bit of a loopy day. But thank you very much for that. Happy 21st. He says. There you go. It's a 21 can salute. I love it. All right, let's. Uh, we're back on that course. Let's go ahead and let auto track that for us. Nav mode. There we go. It's going to be about a uh, about of 21. So we'll just spin the heading bug over, kind of in that direction. Doesn't have to match perfectly, but get it close. But uh, thank you very kindly, Mr. Melvin. We appreciate your support as always. You know that. Good to have you here, man. Making our way down to Moncton. I know one of your favorite places to visit on Moncton Mondays, especially, but. Making our way back to Moncton, and we've got two more episodes after tonight to finish up this Douglas Overseas Tour we've been working on for a year and nine months at this point. Love this neck of the woods, says Melvin, where there's a really great community of that same air traffic controllers that works this region. I, unfortunately, don't get the chance to interact with them all that much. <clears throat> but I know they're a lot of fun. Good guys. Uh, it's a 49 miles inbound now to Deer Lake. Let's go ahead and take a spin through the engine gauges, temps, and uh, the manifold pressure slipping just a little bit. We'll get it up there. Back to 34. Solar head temps right where we wanted the, to want them to be. The uh, aux tanks are nice and balanced, 155 gallons and decreasing. Main tanks are 130 gallons and decreasing. You missed it, uh, Melvin. It took us quite a work, quite a bit of work. I mean, true to the latest entry into the alpha memes, I completely screwed up the fuel balance. And uh, took some work to get it back there. But an hour and a half into the stream, we had just gotten the fuel balance figured out. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's how it goes on this channel. That's why, it, that's why it got added to the meme list this week. I did not do that on purpose, but, you know, hey, it's a meme for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah, fuel re -un well we did some fuel un unbalancing and then we and then we did some fuel rebalancing. Re -un well yeah, re unbalancing. It was unbalanced and then we re unbalanced it. And then we rebalanced it. It's always a you know it's a you know it's a it's a process. You gotta get there eventually. <laughs> true to form though man true to form I mean it did, didn't plan it that way after I just added it to the list this week but man it just it's like I said it's there for a reason <laughs> I don't mean to be a meme it just happens <laughs> Alright, with everything going according to the uh, according to the way the coach drew it on the chomp board for the moment, I think I'm going to take another quick break out of the cockpit. Liquid uh, liquid recycling good right now. I don't think I need any liquid recycling at the moment. But a, just a just a stretch break. I tell you what, I had a slightly arduous day at work. And we need, uh, yeah, I still got the anti-icing on, even though we've been in, in and out of clear air. You know, I guess in reality, I should, I should pop those off, and we should conserve the, you know, again, I don't know if it's a heating element, or if it's fluid in this aircraft, and I don't know this aircraft's anti-icing and de-icing systems well enough to really know, and of course, 
anti-icing and de-icing are not the same thing. For purposes of the Aeroworks DC-3, we just kind of, they're, they're more or less uh, all one thing. Um, DC-6 has a little bit better, a little bit more of an authentic simulation of anti- and de-icing systems. Um, but in this aircraft, like I said, I think we're just going to leave them on as, as soon as we, you know, we see that we're potentially flitting through some moisture up ahead. So just to be on the safe side, especially while I'm out of the cockpit. When I'm sitting here, I'm a little more cavalier about turning it off if I don't think I need it at the moment. But uh, I always kind of ha have to try and keep half an eye on the airspeed gauge. In, in the Aeroworks DC-3, you would not see the ice start to build up on the windshield as your visual indicator. We do have a little add-on that will come up over here, a little depiction, a little stick figure depiction of the plane that would tell us. But the other kind of immediate uh, telltale sign is that indicated airspeed drops off precipitously. Uh, that's, you know, unrelated to any kind of a change in engine power output. So that's usually your warning sign. But anyway, I'm going to leave the anti-icing on while I take a quick break out of the cockpit. We do have a ton of flying left to do. This is a nice long one for you tonight, guys, as we continue to make our way on a proper IFR routing down the east coast of Canada over Newfoundland right now. And then we're going to hop across to Prince Edward Island and in on to Moncton where the weather is starting to get a little rough, guys. Is that is that trending toward our destination? Let's see. Yeah, it certainly is. So we'll race it. We'll see if we can beat it in there. We might luck out if it's trending north, and we're coming in east. Maybe we'll maybe we'll skirt in in this little hole here. But who knows? Who knows? We'll see what happens. Lots of flying left to do. So uh, the method of getting rid of the wing ice in the DC-3 was inflating and deflating wing de-icing boots. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's what that would be de-icing boots over there that would cycle. I mean, we might, I don't know if they would, would automatically cycle periodically or if, uh, if that would be a manual cycle there that we would do. Presumably they cycle periodically on their own. But we'll leave that running. We'll leave the light on for you as we take a quick break out of the cockpit with, as I said, lots of flying left to do for you tonight on the Slant Alpha channel. So tight, folks.
back we are and uh, Smitty is giving us some information on the DC-3's de-icing, what we were talking about, the boots, and he says if some of the lift was compromised by ice buildup, the airplane in most cases would still fly, albeit not as well. Well, I experienced that firsthand, it's been a long time actually, but I think, you know, many of us know that X-Plane 11 does tend to over-model icing a little aggressively so whether or not the plane would still fly this plane would still fly in uh, in a complete icing situation I don't know I don't want to find out the hard way um, I do at this point want to go ahead and take this thing up another 2,000 feet just to see if we can get a little bit out of the cloud tops here Yeah, Chugly, we got the de-icing boots on, so we should be fine. Um, but we're just right in through the cloud tops here. So, you know, again, in order to conserve, and, and again, I guess if it's de-icing boots, if this is what that is, then you know, we're not really conserving much by shutting them off, except for whatever little electrical power they take to, uh, to operate. But again, the longer you operate something, the more it wears down and the more likely it breaks. So in the real world, obviously, you, you again, you wouldn't want to run it if you didn't have to. Um, but let's go ahead and take the plane up another 2,000 feet just to see if we can get, you know, above these cloud tops here. Let's we'll see what happens. Where are we navigationally? 19 miles and counting down. Okay, so we may need to manage the navigation transition. Oh, it's the engine vacuum pumps, says Ice Cold. Gotcha. Well, what's what would how do the valves operate? Just a, just a mechanical valve? I, you know, I guess anything anything wears out over time, right? Well, you should know. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and take this thing up a couple thousand feet just to see if we can get out of the uh, out of the cloud tops here. We're going to open up the cow flaps just a touch. We're going to enrich the uh, mixture, and that's not a euphemism today. Go ahead and take them up to 25 and 40. We'll let autopilot manage the uh, the climb here. Twenty-five on the RPMs, forty on the manifolds. And in the meantime, let's be ready. Sixteen miles. And what is our next navigation step? I forget. <coughs> Are we still here? 13.3 Deer Lake, so we're, we're turning out to a 254, I think. Yeah, that's where we are. Uh, again, so while we're, while we're doing that, let's make sure that our headings all agree. We're looking like a 2.0 on the nose there. So we got a couple degrees to adjust our gyros, make sure they're all in agreement. Still on attempts in the climb are looking good. Try and keep 40 on the manifold if we can. Well, that might be the best we can get on the manifold pressure at this point. But Ice Cold, if what you're saying is that there's no real harm in running the de-icing boots when you don't really need them, then I guess there's no reason not to err on the side of safety. So that's good to know. said a few moments ago that I didn't need another drink, but I was incorrect. Alright, so, 220 on the nose, 
So that's now correct. That's off by one. Let it sort itself out one more time. 700 feet to go. You know, one thing we don't know really is uh, what's the local altimeter setting. Let's just get one from nearby. I can't even really read that. Was it CYDF? Let's do it on the. Uh, let's do it on the pilot client. CYDF. So we did METAR, CYDF, and uh, 2 niner niner zero. okay. So it does need to be adjusted upward from where I have it. So that'll reduce the amount of, that we have to climb because we're a little higher than we think we are. There we are, 200 feet to go. Still 9.4 miles and counting down to our navigation transition so we can accomplish the level off here. Leave it in climb power for just a moment. Okay, so Chugly and Ice Cold are basically saying that these are not that effective if you just leave them on. You would, you would indeed. I was saying or saying earlier that I didn't really know how they operated in this aircraft, whether you would cycle them on. And as a matter of fact, they probably aren't clickable switches. Then they probably are um, kind of like the primer, where they only stay in that position until you hold it. You know, while you hold it, and it probably just automatically comes back down. I don't know. I, again, I've not really studied up on how the, the anti and de icing systems in this aircraft um, really work. And again, how they are, how they work in the simulator is not how they really would work in the real world, as well. So, yeah, uh, and Ice Cold just made the same exact point. So again, not super realistically the way it's, it's been implemented here. All right, but by the same token, we are back up at our cruise speed so we can knock the power settings back down to our cruise settings. 23 and 34, we'll go ahead and put the mix back into auto lean. We'll adjust the uh, cow flaps again. Whoops. Cow flaps are that button here. Close them up most of the way. And again, the, the, the way the cow flaps operate in this plane is not really correctly modeled either. But we'll aim to keep the temps around 200. And we'll do another check, make sure we got 23 and 34. So there we go. Yeah, and Smitty makes the good point, which is that, you know, for, for all the, the little inaccuracies in it, this is a very well done um, model for a freeware plane. <laughs> all right, well, let's not lose sight of our navigation transition here. So we're 2.6, and we're, we're 10,000 feet, so we're about a mile, mile and... Uh, 1.6 miles above this VOR, so it's not going to count down to zero. Let's remind ourselves we're going to be outbound on a 254. 220, 220 is all around, so all of our instruments agree what port direction we're pointed. We'll pop it into heading mode. We're going to be outbound on a 254. We can actually just go ahead and set that now. There's a 250, and yeah, we'll go. So there's 254. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's it. We're passing the VOR now, so let's go ahead and make the turn. Turned a little late, so I'm going to turn to about a 270.
as soon as we see the needle come back in, we can uh, we'll adjust the heading to recapture it, uh, and or just pop it right into nav mode. Oh, whoa, wow! So I didn't turn that late, <laughs> and then overcorrect it. So now the plane is uh. kind of over aggressively sorting that out again a little bit more of a shallow heading intercept you know heading heading correction would have worked out better in that scenario there so we did a little zigzagging but we got it and again so we can uh, and I always say the closer in you are the less of a correction you need to make so I was close enough in that a tw even a 20 degree correction was a little bit of an overshoot there. If we want to see, again, I don't consider this, this cheating. On a VFR stream or a dead reckoning stream, I consider this cheating. But since I know for sure where I am, this is not a cheat to me. This is just to, to see exactly what happened there. So yeah, I knew I turned late. But a 20 degree overshoot was too much and then the plane had to correct it and then get us back on whereas if I had made a shallower correction you know that would have worked a little better I think and 10,000 really didn't get us out of the icing trouble either <laughs> oh well. <clears throat> oh well, we'll watch the airspeed. We're turning about 150 there, so if it starts to drop, we'll know. The other thing to do is go ahead and get a step ahead navigation wise again we know this is a shorter leg it's still 70 miles though but about 35 miles out we would transition to where we're navigating inbound to 13.1 I think we've got 13.1 already tuned in down here and we uh, we can see that we're pretty well on that course again that 074 which in this case would be a 254 so the radials on this uh, leg do match up a little bit better than they have on previous ones and we know since we are receiving that station and it does have DME associated we can flip that back and forth and yeah we can see that the total mileage is about 70 so at about 35 we'll switch so we're navigating inbound to the next one down the line still bopping through the cloud tops but we're still turning between 145 and 150. So, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Let's make sure we, yeah, see. Silverhead temps are running a little bit high. Let's back the manifold pressure off just a touch. But we can also open up those cow flaps some. Matter of fact, let's open them up. Let's open up a lot. Get those things cooled back down. And then we'll put it about there. We'll see how that does. cow flaps have an effect on drag as well so we might see a little bit of a change in our indicated airspeed but if we see a, a sudden drop off we'll know that icing may may well be a cause
Yeah, anyway, to go back to the icing discussion, because <clears throat> I kind of glossed over Chuckley's message there. Um, but yeah, so the way that the de-icing boots work, and Chuckley's description is, is good. A little, little rubber patch on the leading edge of the wing, and maybe also on the trailing edge, but certainly on the leading edge is where the ice buildup is, is I guess. Okay, well, maybe, maybe both. Um, but yeah, it's a little rubber paddle that inflates slightly and pops the ice off just by the change in the shape or by the expansion, I guess, of the of the wing, right? The surface area increases, but the ice surface area doesn't, so the ice breaks and falls off. And then you deflate it. And, uh, and then you repeat that inflate them for just a second you know once every x number of seconds or minutes or whatever and that's what keeps popping the ice off that builds up on the wing um so i don't know again and i just it's really just don't know a how it is in the dc3 generally speaking b it might be different from one specific dc3 to another um these are definitely switches that you turn on and they stay on. I would think if they were manually cycled, they would be push switches, kind of like the primer, where when you let go of it, it returns to its uh, its resting position. Um, some de-icing boots cycle automatically, so if you leave them on, that just means that they're cycling once every X number of seconds. You know, again, uh, how 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 it's how it would how it should be in this plane versus how it's modeled in this specific plane may or may not be the same thing so but again it's 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 a system that i really haven't spent a lot of time worrying about so uh so yeah but charlie is absolutely correct that the boots you know staying inflated really wouldn't do anything for you it's the inflation itself that pops the ice off again because the surface area that it's resting on suddenly gets bigger and the ice just can't keep up so it just breaks now the, now the other thing that can happen is if it's and I don't know the different types of ice that well either but if it's like a slushy ice then the boot pushes it out but then it's the, the, say the boot pushes the ice out some, but then the ice just kind of holds that shape and the boot inflates and deflates, but the ice kind of just holds that outer shape and then the boot doesn't do anything for it anymore because it can't, it can't inflate more and push it off. So I've heard that, heard of that happening and that's got a name and I don't remember what it is. So you can get into some dangerous situations where the boot fails to remove the ice because of that and again that's that would happen in a kind of a slushier ice I suppose and then your your, your recourse is to descend then into uh, warmer air hope that it melts it that way but we've definitely seen on this stream um, how aggressive the ice modeling in X-Plane can be And I was flying this aircraft in the Seattle area once where suddenly found myself in trouble of, uh, in danger of stalling. Wasn't quite sure what was going on. Realized that I was in uh, cold temps and moisture. Turned the anti-icing situation on, yeah, the anti-icing systems on, and, uh, and it recovered. So I was like, well, hey, I learned something there. And then there was a stream in the Barren where icing came on so suddenly and aggressively that I didn't realize what was happening until I was spiraling toward the ground. We did not survive that one. One of the, uh, one of the relatively few catastrophic non-survivable crashes that we've had on stream. Uh, we've probably had, what, five or six? In the... Uh, the three and a half years that I've been uh, streaming.
And Chugley says if you're um, if you're flying into icing, forming on the wings behind the boots, it's a it's a required deviation. Yeah, yeah, re required diversion. Yeah, and again, you know, the visual effect of the icing is not modeled at all in this aircraft, so we we wouldn't really know that. Leo is here. Leo from Argentina. Thank you for checking us out tonight. It says the sky is really cloudy. Yes, indeed. And we are in X Plane 11 today, not Flight Sim 2020, but we have the the uh, payware mod for X Plane called Enhanced Skyscapes. Skyscapes. My voice cut out there for a second. Enhanced Skyscapes. And and man, and they do a that does a really nice job of modeling those. Nice puffy volumetric clouds, very similar to what you see in flights in 2020. We are in the uh, the AeroWorks Douglas DC-3 for X-Plane 11. It's a freeware version of the DC-3. Nice custom livery that a friend of the stream made for us. But yeah, very nice looking, uh, very nice looking clouds with that mod. Pretty affordable too. Fifteen fifteen dollars US, as I recall, if I have that right. And, uh, and well worth it. Okay, so do I have them? On? Yeah, do I have the anti-icing on? I do not. Yeah, at this point, this point, I'm going to turn them on. And I and, and so going back to the, the discussion of how it's modeled, I don't think a lot of thought was put into it. Um, but basically, if you're in icing conditions and you turn those switches on and leave them on, it you're fine. So, so again, does it fully model all of the scenarios you can encounter with that? Probably not. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy enough with myself when I fly through a cloud and I think, oh, what's the OAT? I should turn the anti-icing on. If I have that complete a thought about the process, I'm happy with myself. <laughs> So Red Warhawk says it is controlled by a timer, and actuated by a valve. Okay, so it, yeah, we, so we kind of kind of had it right. And oh, and it's 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 divided into multiple tubes. So if one portion of it fails to move the ice, it doesn't fail the entire thing. Pretty cool stuff. No pun intended. <laughs> pun not intended, but appreciated. We got Kevin2007 with the follow. Thanks for that. Now, Skylabs, V Skylabs. Um, it's modeled inside the default X plane parameters, says Trugley, so it looks like it's cycled on a 40 second cycle time with six eight second uh, inflate so there you go yeah and again I mean it's just it's just more detail than I really feel like I need to know so Kevin thank you very much for the follow appreciate you being here tonight making our way down the uh, oh and the uh, and and Leo says I love the MD well this would have been the D before the M got involved. This was Douglas before, this was Douglas before McDonald. This was just a Douglas, yep. This is a 1930s vintage aircraft. A few of them still around, yeah. Uh, so there we are about 35 miles out, 33 miles in. So we're ready to make our navigation transition. Again, kinda. So 248 or 249, something like that, right? Now we're looking down here, about 250 on the nose. 245, so that's that's a degree off that way. That's a couple degrees off that way. Let's let the uh, let the plane shake itself out on a new heading and decide which, which way it wants to point. Yeah, so Charlie says for practical purposes, you can just turn it on and, and leave it on. So that's that, there you go. And since we're you know, seem to be above cloud tops at the moment, I'll turn them off. You know, and again, Ice Cold made the point earlier that, you know, they 
they don't really use any power the mechanical valves but you know again the longer you use something the more likely it wears out and fails right so no, no sense having it on if you don't need it again though with it using you know just a minimal amount of uh, mechanical power to operate definitely want to err on the side of safety I'm tempting fade a little bit just to see how much I can tempt fade by having them off when I don't think I need them um, anyway we're going to tr complete that navigation transition we are now going to head into Stephenville on 113.1 and a 074 so I'll come back to that message there in a moment Chugley but let's go ahead and make that switch um, oh did we get everything in agreement 24 about a 244 I guess there right 244 well wait a minute hold on what's going on here so that says we're on a 244 no that says we're on a 246 or 7 what does this say so obviously I misread one of them a minute ago made it worse rather than better <laughs> okay yeah so there is an airworthiness directive about uh, inspecting them after X number of hours yeah I mean generally speaking right you don't want to run systems that you don't need to run because the more the more you run stuff the sooner it wears out and breaks but again when with IC probably air on the side of safety so we're on a two four six now two four six and two four six okay so now we finally got the gauges all more or less in agreement as to which way we're pointing at that point now I think we can go ahead and pop it into uh, Pop it into heading mode, which we'll first do by matching up the headings. Pop it into heading mode. So now we can fiddle with the radios without changing the, the, the what the plane's trying to track. So we'll manually just tune what we had on Nav 2 up here on Nav 1. If I can find the click spot, there we are, 113.1. And we're supposed to be inbound on a 074, which on the inbound side, if you're coming that way, that's 074 is a 254 which is probably what we have set down here, but we'll go ahead and set it up here. So there's a 250, one, two, three, and four. So it looks like we're about a degree off to the left. We'll correct slightly to the right. And again, so just a 10 degree correction. We'll see how that, well, we're 24 miles out. Negative 15 degree correction. I want to overdo it. <clears throat> and then since we're now inbound to this station on 13-1, and then we're, we're next going to turn south and westbound from that station and navigate in this direction, and then we're going to go only to that point, Yemeti, and then the next VOR down the line that we're going to be navigating toward is Charlottetown on 13.8. So we'll go ahead and get that tuned in. 13.8. Probably too far away to receive that right now, but we'll get it preset. Yeah, okay. So we can see the red flags telling us there's no signal. Flip the DME over seeing that there's no signal. So, yeah, we, we didn't expect there to be one. And... 080. Now this is a, a Tango Airway, but it's depicted in black. So you would think that you can navigate this conventionally, but a Tango Airway would seem like you can't. And there certainly looks more like an RNAV path than a, v, than a, a conventional NAV path, which is marked this way where the 111 is. So there is a bit of a, you know, bit of conflicting information on this chart as to whether this is a conventionally navigable airway. We presume that in X-Plane it's going to probably model that we're receiving that VOR and able to track that radial just fine, so should be okay there. But again, just, just note it that in the real world we would have to really know, is this an error that it's in black, or is this conventionally navigable for sure, or is it not? 
again, the, the markings are a little bit inconsistent from one part of the chart to another, so. Anyway, we're treating it as though it's conventionally navigable, so we're going to tune that in, and uh, we're going to tune that 080 and just uh, hope for the best. Real world, obviously, you couldn't navigate that airway with radio-based navigation if it's RNAV only. But today we will. All right, anyway, so we're south. Oh, so we're inbound to Stevensville. Actually, we're still on this portion inbound to Stevensville. How far out are we? Only 17 miles, so got to be ready to make the southbound turn here. And the point that I was making was 080. So what is that on the inbound side? A 260. So we'll go ahead and tune 260 there just to have it showing. Again, it's not, it's really just for pre-situational awareness. We'll know ahead of time whether we are receiving that station and whether we are on that airway. And especially since it's questionably receivable where we'll be, where we'll be it's good to know. But for now, we just need to know that as we pass over Stevensville, we're going to come outbound on a 220. That's the next step we need to be ready for. Going to Halifax or Moncton? We are going to Moncton, sir. At least that's the plan. Halifax, we filed as an alternate. Now, the weather coming into Moncton looked like it was starting to get a little questionable. So we were noticing that earlier. Looks like we're still east of it, but uh, not sure that's going to continue to be the case. So we'll see what happens. But we did file Mon uh, Halifax down here. As our, uh, as our alternate, which hopefully will stay east of the weather, just in case we need to divert. Let's do a quick spin through the uh, engine gauges. Everything looking good from temps and pressure standpoint. Silver head temps looking nice and nice and happy. We know the mains have about 130 gallons each. Where are we with the aux tanks? We're now just under 120 each. So we're good there. Warhawk says, I placed a few links in uh, general under, yeah, under general in your uh, Discord about the DI's boot operation in case anyone's interested. Very cool, man. We'll, we'll do, some, do some reading on that later. Are we above these cloud tops now? I think I turned them off earlier. Yeah, I did. All right, so do we have the plane all in agreement as to the direction it's pointing? 262 or thereabouts? 262? 262? Yeah, we're good there. 11 miles out and counting down. And then we're going from that. Where are we? 220 again. 220, and we're only taking that out 65 miles but we're not navigating to the next station down the line in this case, but we're making a turn at that 65 mile point at Yumeti. So at the point we get 65 miles out from Yumeti is when we should intercept the uh, inbound radial that we've dialed into the next station up the line. So we'll see how well that works for us. Ooh, did we knock the plane out of, oh, we're in heading mode. So, our first gross navigational error of the evening. Surprised there haven't been a few more of those. C. George is here. Alright, so at this point, not really worried about the direction we're coming into the VOR. I'm just going to navigate directly to it this way. Yeah, screwed that all up by being I. I didn't want the uh, I didn't want auto to make a radical correction, so I made a very gentle correction and then just stayed on that gentle correction. 
That's never happened before on this stream. But anyway, as we pass over that VOR, outbound on a 220, and then we'll, uh, we'll put that nasty episode behind us, shall we? Go ahead and set a 220 in anticipation of that, but for right now, like I said, we know we wound up well. So we're on a 230. Yeah, I will draw what happened there, and then we'll look at the moving map to see how close my drawing is. So we're coming into that on a, uh, on a 225. So we wound up way north of it. So we made the correction, and I said I needed, oh, we needed to go about 15 degrees right, because we I guess we were coming in this way. Well, let me try that again. <laughs> As we were coming in, we were left, of course. We needed to correct to the right. So I was like, okay, yeah, we'll correct to the right, no problem. But then we kept correcting to the right because I didn't put it back into nav mode. So now we're coming in kind of more on this angle, and then we're almost going to just go straight over it. So that's what I think happened based on what, uh, based on the sequence of events. <clears throat> and then after we uh, get established on that outbound 220, we'll pull up the moving map and we'll see how close my depiction is. Anomalous says, starting to learn to fly in a Cessna 172 on flights in 2020, are there free online detailed documentations for the aircraft. I don't know about the default necessarily. Um, some aircraft you can find online pilot operating handbooks and some it's a little harder. Some aircraft manufacturers consider that kind of stuff proprietary and they go after you and ask you to take it down. Um, I think my detailed stuff for the 172 kind of came from the Reality Expansion Pack that I purchased for the X-Plane 172. And I guess there's probably some pretty good literature out there on like the some of the other payware 172s, like the Airfoil Labs or the uh, what are some of the other uh, payware 172s, guys. Pick a five spring says, would love to have been at the meeting where the guy that thought of the ice boots presented his idea. Says, we just take rubber bladders, we stick them on the front of the leading edge, and we just run an air pump. When the ice builds up, you just like blow it up like a balloon. Ice pops off. It's simple. Well, pick a five string. That, that actually kind of reminds me. Hang on. So we're, we're kind of passing that VOR. We're not passing it too accurately got to do that in a Brooklyn accent since Melvin. Well, if only I could. All right, so there we are. We're passing the VOR. Let's go ahead and get get get, get more on a 220. So pick a five string. It kind of reminds me of the initial development cycle of the helicopter. Because in the very beginning of the helicopter's development, you know, the big issue they were trying to solve was, okay, if the rotor's turning one way, the helicopter wants to turn the other way. So how do we counteract that? And all these you know, elegant proposals came, with, with which would be like two rotors spinning in opposite directions above each other, and all these other, you know, really kind of elegant um, symmetrical solutions that they couldn't quite get to work out. The helicopters weren't stable. And the idea of just putting another rotor on the back of the thing to counteract the torque, it was like, yeah, but that's so, it's so inefficient. It couldn't possibly work. I mean, really, you're just taking the torque that the plane, that the, 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 uh, yeah, that the, the vessel wants to do and you're just blowing a bunch of air in the opposite direction? How is that How is that at all efficient? And so finally they were like, all right, well, let's try it. And that turned out to be the way that you'd keep a helicopter, you know, stable. <laughs> but it was like, it's the most, 
like the solution that it turned out to be the one that was the most effective and, and easiest to manufacture and control and and uh, and make work. But yeah, the initial designs for the helicopter didn't include that anti-torque. They were just trying to come up with a, a more elegant, less um, what do they call it? bull in the china shop or less uh, you know, less hit it with a mallet solution than just blowing a bunch of air in the opposite direction. <laughs> Flakbait87 with the follow. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here tonight. We're hanging out while we're flying the Douglas DC-3 from Goose Bay, Canada, down to Moncton, Canada. And so this was the error I had just talked about, if you're just joining us. we As we made the navigation transition, we naturally wound up just a little bit left of course. So we corrected back to the right, but I was in heading mode. And left it in heading mode, so that correction stayed in, and I went right across that course and then wound up north of the VOR as I made the... Uh, as I made the pass. Now let's pull up the moving map and see how that really looked. Yeah, pretty much what I said, huh? I hope that some of that's not off the screen for you guys. But yeah, that's almost exactly what I drew, isn't it? If you're new to the channel, we do all this all this uh, navigation on this channel. Well, not all. In this aircraft, certainly, yes. Uh, but we typically do the majority of the navigation on this channel just through the old-school radio-based navigation, which on this channel typically means VOR radial tracking. Uh, up in Canada, sometimes it means NDB bearing tracking. Up in Canada and Alaska occasionally other places. Let's just humor them. Let's put the sideways rotor on and just try it. It's not going to work, but we'll try it. <laughs> right. I mean, the pick a five spring. So, uh, and I think it was, what is it, Sikorsky? Uh, were they, was that the, was that the pioneer, the helicopter pioneer that, that eventually convinced them, just try it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm boiling down that narrative a lot, but uh, that's essentially, that's like the, the Reader's Digest version of how it worked. I guess I can't say the Reader's Digest version anymore. Nobody knows what the Reader's Digest version is. So the TL semicolon DR version. <laughs> As the kids would say these days. Anyway, where are we navigationally? I think we're... Now, south and west of Stevensville, we're going 65 miles out to this point, Yemeti. And I, I think we're probably still not going to... We're 176 miles. I There's no way we're going to actually be receiving that VOR at that point. There's no way. So, again, it's, it's marked in black, which leads you to believe it's a conventionally navigable airway, but it is a tango route, which normally means it's an RNAV airway. So I'm leaning towards this is an RNAV airway, and we're going to have to end up kind of doing some dead reckoning. So when we get to that point, Yemeti, 65 miles out from this VOR, we're just going to turn on a 260. And we'll just we'll keep that 260 until we get close enough to start receiving this, and then we'll just scooch back over onto that airway when we, uh, when we do. Again, not nothing that you would really be able to do in the real world. That that would be highly, highly questionable real world. But that's why we that's why we're in flight sim. Yeah, some brass balls to get inside the first helicopters and fly them. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Ugly, ugly machines, but man, they so versatile from a application standpoint. Yeah, nothing, nothing doing on Nav 2 yet. We wouldn't expect there to be. I'm really on at this point. Now that I see that it's 176 miles, I'm really not expecting there to be even when we make that navigation transition. But heck, we'll try. Why not? Talk about humoring ourselves. 
Um, 219 is our gyroscopic. What is the... Uh, so that's a 221, I guess. So we'll correct everything here. Make it reflect that we're on a 221. 221. Let the airplane decide what way it wants to point. So Anomalous says, track the VOR to the southeast of your course. Yeah, I mean, we can. We can, um, uh, well, southeast or southwest. I'm not sure which one you meant. I guess maybe southwest. Um, I mean, we could we could track this one inbound, and we could plot a series of lines um, along this path to approximate it, right? We can use it as a point-bearing distance um, reference point to, uh, to, to track our progress along that path until we start picking up. I mean, we should be able to do that. How, how distant are we from that? We're another 92 miles down the line from that. It's gonna and it's gonna get less as we as we come across the uh, the right angle point. It'll get less than whoops. So yeah, that could certainly um, we've done that before, anomalous. We've done that on some v VFR streams. You know, so we could we could do a, a plot here. Off of this VOR, of course, we know the we know the point bearing distance off of that VOR here, but as we track down here, we can you know we'll do another one when we're at like a zero zero zero, and we should be X number of miles that put us there, and here we might end up uh, we might end up a little farther north because of wind correction, so we'll know that instead of a two sixty, we might fly a two fifty for a bit. I mean, we can certainly do that. Point bearing distance references are very very handy tools wouldn't do that at all in the real world anomalous that wouldn't be sufficient in instrument conditions but uh, just as a just as a learning exercise and a practical exercise in the sim yeah why not absolutely we've done it we've done it, we've done it on the stream before yeah no it's it's a great it's a great thought anomalous uh, it like i said it wouldn't fly for real, because the the purpose of an instrument course, an instrument route, is of course to keep you out of harm's way when it comes to obstacles and terrain, and uh, and and other traffic. So you do have to navigate these paths with a certain degree of accuracy. Uh, that is, um, you know, and that that degree of accuracy is uh, is known by the controllers. Like in uh, you know GPS, they expect that what they call required navigation performance to be much more precise on course and I think VOR airways I think you get a good amount on either side it's four or five miles laterally and uh, somebody somebody brought up the reference in a recent stream it's it's miles laterally especially on some of those longer ones I think they even give you a bump out toward the middle because they know that there's an inherent imprecision in that route but still you do have to navigate it within certain tolerances and the, the whole purpose is to give you obstacle clear, clearance. So if you're navigating something that imprecise, you know, like we were talking about, it wouldn't be good enough to uh, to keep you safe. But it'd be, like I said, it would be fun. It's it's fun from a uh, a theoretical sim challenge standpoint, and that's why, you know, like I said, we've certainly done it a couple times on stream. And we we tend to when we fly VFR a lot of times anomalous when we're trying to navigate good enough not to feel lost exactly. So when we're trying to navigate visually, like we've got the VFR map up, you know, or we're trying, we're down here in the Boston area, <clears throat> trying to navigate, you know, across this terrain, and we, we think we're over this lake, but we might be over, you know, this lake instead, and we want to we want to be sure. We'll tune up one of these VORs, and we'll see, you know, this, like this VOR. Well, are we on more of a... Zero, zero, zero off of that VOR, or are we on more of a three, two, zero? Okay, well that tells us kind of which lake we're over. Well, let's just plot a point, and and Sky Vector's great at it, by the way, Anomalous. Just as an example, I'm going to blank out this route, and we'll put it back in in a minute here. Um, 
but let's say you're going from yeah let's 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 pick an example is that Bradley there oh no that's Schenectady no this is Albany that's Albany okay so that's K-A-L-B and let's say we're going K-A-L-B to uh, who cares yeah, yeah Laconia so we're going K-A-L-B to K-L-C-I we're doing this VOR uh, via VFR rather so we're, we're navigating visually. We're trying to follow, like, we've, we flew east, and we're like, we're, we've gone this far, and we're trying to follow this this river and this highway. We're not sure if we're following the correct river and highway. Uh, we found ourselves over a lake again. We're not sure if we're over Newfound Lake or we're over uh, uh, Sundapee, or, uh, yeah, Sundapee Lake. But we know we're on a uh, 320 and 20 miles off of Concord VOR. Well, let's just type Concord... Look, the, the radial is 320, and then three digits for the mileage. So three digits for the direction, three digits for the mileage, and hit enter. Oh, look, we're right there. Okay, good. Well, we're just barely east of Sunapee Lake then. So it can be a real real effective tool to plot uh, point-bearing distance radials or references in, right in here in SkyVector. Great, uh, great tool. I use it all the time. I blow people's minds with that little trick all the time. Now... I gotta put my route back the way I had it. Oh God! <laughs> it was a C Y Y R, and it was that, and it was C Y Q M. Should be 712 or something. Change. Yeah, there we are. Okay, good. <laughs> now back to your regularly scheduled program. Where are we? Yeah, okay, so we're coming up on this point, you Yumeti. We're 65, aiming to be 65 miles south and west. And then, like I said, we're just going to turn to a 260. Probably, uh, yeah, probably wander around this course a little bit until we get closer in. And we'll try some point-bearing distance um, refs off of uh, Sydney just to, just to see what happens. So we're supposed to be 65 miles, and so far we're 33 miles. A little ways to go, nothing doing on NAV2 yet, and I, like I said, I, I fully expect we won't pick up anything on NAV2 until well after we make that turn, but, well, one can dream. We'll see what happens. Spin through the engine gauges at this point would be good. Let's make sure we're not about to burn our aux tanks dry. Ice cold's got to run. Tomorrow is a long day. Yeah, man, so uh, we'll see you Saturday. I got a shirt here for you. What else have I got? I got a shirt. Oh, and I'm supposed to bring an E6B down to play with. So we will definitely see you Saturday, brother. Safe travel, sir. Yeah, very cool. I'll be getting... I'm, I'm wifey and I... So I, I think at this point, wifey is a... Uh, wifey's a lock. So wifey and I are going to head down. We're going to get on the road early Saturday morning and head down. Yeah, probably mid-afternoon we'll be down. It's about five hours for us. So we'll see you then. Talking about ZDC Live, by the way, guys. Those of you who are not keeping up with the conversation, we're going to be controlling for you on Saturday evening the Capital Christmas event where we're going to be broadcasting live from what we're calling an undisclosed location in Roanoke, Virginia, hosted by one of our ZDC controllers. And Ice Cold, even though he's not a ZDC controller, he in the, in the real world, he's based in the uh, based in the D.C. metro area. So he, uh, he snuck in an invite down to the ZDC live event. I think he technically is on, visiting, on the visiting roster now. But we snuck him in an invite to the ZDC live event. And so... We're going to be controlling Dulles Tower for you on that Saturday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope that you guys will fly in and see us. I've been told that there is a question about the internet connectivity there. So 
We'll see what happens with that. Hopefully, we'll be able to broadcast for you without melting my phone. But we'll we'll we'll, uh, they'll just let anyone in these days. It's good fixings. Yeah. Well, when you got a Twitch handle like Ice Cold, we assume that you're bringing beverages. So. <laughs> All right, so forty miles and counting up. Let's just take a peek here 220 on the nut on the on the nose that one's off by a couple degrees that one's off by a couple degrees David 4DW, my goodness, man. I don't think I've seen you in about forever. How have you been? It says I'm practicing the BVA Wings IFR 16 in the uh, working title CJ4. Nice. Very cool, man. Yeah, that one, Syracuse to Boston. That one worked out pretty well for us if I remember correctly. The one into Syracuse got a little funky because we had to fly an Arnav approach to a closed runway, if I remember correctly. But Syracuse to Boston worked out all right. I mean, they all worked out all right. Only one that didn't work out all right was the one I did over again. <laughs> and that was my fault. That was really crappy fuel planning that, uh, that turned us into a glider unexpectedly. And not that good of a glider, unfortunately. <laughs> One of our, we were talking earlier about the number of catastrophic landings, or, uh, well, catastrophic crashes that we've had on stream, which I think are number about five or six. Uh, that stream ended in an off-airport landing that would have been problematic and would have put us through a fence or a house or something. We counted it kind of as a uh, survivable one, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> we made an unscheduled visit to a uh, to a cow pasture in Vermont. Could we have walked away? Eh, possibly. Could we have used the airframe again afterward? Uh, with a little duct tape, perhaps. <laughs> the old adage, if you don't know, guys, is uh, any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. If you can reuse the airplane afterward, it's a great landing. Fortunately, in the sim world, they're all great landings because we can walk away from all of them and reuse the airplanes afterwards. So we're blessed in that regard. <laughs> oh, and did I uh, did I check on the did I check on the fuel situation? I guess I did. Mains are still at 130. Oxes are still at 100. Got like, plenty of fuel. For now. Alright, so 48 and it's 65, I said, we're turning, I think. Yeah, 65 out on that 220. By the way, so we did uh, did correct the uh, gyroscopic headings. The gyroscopic uh, instruments in this plane do drift out 
gradually, and you'd have to occasionally bump them back into uh, agreement with your magnetic gauge. This one's still about a degree off, it looks like. There we go. Fifty miles. So we got another 15 miles. I'm going to go ahead and take a break, grab another Red Bull. It's going to be a three Red Bull night, guys. Bit of a longer flight for you as we go Goose Bay to Moncton. And uh, instead of fudging it and going straight across, we went ahead and put ourselves on a proper IFR route, even though it took us kind of out of the way. So, uh, but a good, uh, good exercise in actually flying real IFR rather than that fake IFR we've been doing for most of this Douglas Overseas series. We'll talk more about that after we get back in. Um, <laughs> yeah, pick a pie string. We'll come back to that point here in just a moment. Lots of flying left to do, guys. Probably about another two hours yet. So uh, sit tight and enjoy. We'll be back with you on the Slate Alpha channel.
right, guys, we're back with you on the Slant Alpha channel. We're in the DC-3, the Aeroworks Freeware DC-3 for X-Plane 11. We make our way from Goose Bay to Moncton in extreme northeastern Canada. We're wrapping up a series called Douglas Overseas. We've been working on this series bit by bit, episode by episode, for about a year and nine months. we got two more episodes after tonight. We're going to land in Moncton, and the next episode that follows, we'll take it from Moncton to Portland, Maine. And then in the finale, which will be happening on New Year's Day, we'll go from Portland, Maine to uh, Danbury, Connecticut, and then back home to Baltimore, Maryland. Let's pop it into heading mode, turn it to about a 260. As expected, I'll catch you guys up if you just joined. As expected, we got to this point 65 miles out from the VOR that's behind us, and we should be receiving the VOR that's ahead of us. But we got it tuned in here. 13, oh, 13.8, first of all, is that the right frequency? I guess I should double check that. I think it is. Yeah, 13.8, Charlottetown. Uh, we're not yet receiving it. We can see the red flags here on the VOR2, and we can see that there's nothing showing up on the DME. We still got the VOR to our, you know, behind us. So we can use that. We can probably use the one that's off to our left here as well. Sydney VOR 114.9. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and tune 13.8 and 080. We'll talk more about the markings here and why I feel like they're a little bit contradictory. But we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's just get the plane... Uh, let's get the nav radio set up so that when we do finally get Charlottetown in reception range, you know, we'll have it tuned in, ready to go. 13.8, and uh, again, it's a 260 because we're flying, we're flying, to, okay, we're coming into it on a 080 radial, and you'll, you know, those of you who really know how to read these charts are already going, wait a minute. Does he not see it? Yeah, I do. I'll get to that in a minute. Well, let's go ahead and tune a 260 here. And we're going to just find this airway eventually down the road when we find it. Now, a couple of things. Uh, oh, and then the other thing we said we'll do is we'll use the Sydney VOR just, just for the purpose of the exercise. 14.9 see if we're receiving that 14 niner yeah we are okay so and it's to our well we would be out from it so the easiest way to do this is we are out from it at what approximately well slightly less than a zero four zero at this point right because at the point we were at that 65 mile marker we should be we should have been dead center on a zero four zero at least darn close. So we're going to be slightly less than a 040. So if we spin it around here, we'll just spin it till it centers. And of course, we're not tracking directly toward it. So that's going to change as we proceed westbound. Our bearing to that station is going to decrease. So that'll change. And the distance is going to decrease at least until the point where we get perpendicular to it. So it's not going to decrease linearly, but it'll continue to decrease until we get to whatever this point is here. Anyway. So let's back up a step. We knew we were navigating south and west along this Victor Airway for 65 miles to this point of Yemeti. At that point... At that point, we expected to be receiving 
and again, this is a this is an airway that's depicted in the color black on the chart. That normally means it's a conventionally navigable airway, meaning that you should be able to navigate it through VOR uh, bearings and uh, radials rather. And again, it comes off of the uh, Gander VOR at a two six nine. Maybe we're gonna try that one twelve seven. Nope, not receiving that. <laughs> we'll put it back on 14 niner. Okay, anyway. So, because it's depicted in black, you would think, and it's got a radio marked off of a VOR, you would think, okay, well, that means it's a conventionally navigable airway. But it's, it's denoted as a Tango Airway, which is odd because normally a Tango Airway means it's RNAV navigable only. You can only navigate this if you've got like a GPS or, you know, an FMC with an inertial nav system, normally cross-reference to a GPS, something that can navigate to stuff without the need of a radio, you know, a radio transmitter on the ground somewhere. So already we're kind of seeing something contradictory here. We're seeing a, a, a radial off of a VOR, roots depicted in black, but it's depicted, it's, it's designated as a tango. Okay, so that's weird. We keep going down, and here's where we're intercepting it at this point, Umeti. But when we get down to this chart, and you can see there's a seam in the chart here, this, um, this world low, world high, these are all digitally stitched together charts to create one big chart. So this is obviously where there's some sort of a seam in two charts that have been digitally stitched together at this point. And you can see it goes from being a conventionally navigable depicted airway in black to an RNAV airway depicted in blue, which is what you would expect for an RNAV airway. And this 080 isn't marked on the radial like this is on the 111 outbound east way. But the 080 is marked in blue with the arrow, that's, and that's an RNAV airway, 288, this way, RNAV, 106, this way, RNAV, from, uh, uh, from Ear Dove, 285, with the arrow, in blue. So this is all marked like an RNAV airway that you can't navigate with radio-based beacons, and this is marked like an airway that you can't navigate with radio-based beacons, but out here, it's, it's contradictory. So again, it's, it's part, part of the problem is that the sky vector is not Outside of the U.S., Sky Vector is not really the full actual charts. Maybe the Navigraph on route chart would have something more informative. Maybe we should look at that. we got time. We'll look at that. Anyway, now, the other thing you can do, you're in contact with air traffic control. Ordinarily, if you're IFR, you're talking to a controller. And you would ordinarily, if you're if you're navigating between two VORs and all of a sudden you find yourself in a dead spot and you're not receiving it, you know, not receiving either one, it's very simple. Moncton Center, November 514 Delta Victor, unable to receive my uh, next navigation station. Can you give us a heading to fly in the meantime? Oh, sure. A, eh? fly, uh, fly a 260 and uh, let us know when you're direct to... Chestertown, or whatever it was called. Charlottetown. Hey. Eh? Okay, we'll do, don't you know? November 5, 1, 4, Delta Victor. Okay, no problem. <laughs> However, <laughs> the plot thickens, right? <laughs> Notice all these points out here are, list, are, are, are depicted as filled in in black. What does that mean? Anybody know? Uh, that one's not. I know, don't, I know, Melvin, I know. I do know. Now I'm mixing, mixing my, uh... Mixing my terrible accents. Um, so... What do these points mean that are filled in in all black? Filled in in all black here. Even, uh, even Moncton VO are filled in in all black. They are, they are considered mandatory reporting points, i.e. you need to tell the controller when you're passing over those. 
Okay, that's all well and good. Why? Why do they need to know that? Can't they just look on their radar scope? Well, the reason they make mandatory reporting points is because their radar coverage in this area is not that good. So you'll be like, Yay, Moncton Center, November 5, when Fort Up to Victor, we're over Yumeti, no longer receiving our VOR station for uh, Charlottetown. Can you give us a vector to fly? Well, November 5, when Fort Up to Victor, Moncton Center, uh, I don't have you on radar, radar coverage out there, so I would say, uh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> Why are you navigating an RNAV airway with uh, radio-based navigation? Because I'm a SIN pilot and I'm just forcing the issue. <laughs> That's why. I mean, the alternative would have been to add another hundred and some odd miles by coming down here to Sydney and then south and west along this airway and then up from there. So we could have, we could have come up with a, you know, a, a, an IFR routing non-RNAV that didn't include this questionable segment that we're on now, but we would have been adding even more to this trip, which we've already added quite a bit to. So anyway, Long story short, we find ourselves on a segment that we really shouldn't be on as a non-RNAV aircraft, and indeed, we are not really able to receive any nav aids that are, that are helping us. We do have, and we're, you can see how slowly this is moving, so we must be approaching the point at the point where we're 100% perpendicular There's, there's a distance which you know, I'm going to say 75 with a question mark where we will get absolutely no closer and after we pass it we'll get farther from that station. We can see that we must be getting pretty close to it now because of how slowly that's moving. Let's just see where we are in relation. If we blank out this route and we just go you many to uh, what is this I see it's Charlotte town oh YYG let's blank out this route and let's just go you many to YYG 176.4 mile leg we know we're somewhere along this probably Let's take a point bearing and distance off of Sydney VOR. And according to this, you just spin it until it centers. And that tells us that we are currently, oh, nice round number. Well, maybe a 021. We're a 021 and 76 miles off of Sydney. What's the identifier? YQY. It couldn't just be SYD, right? No, it's going to be YQY. What did I say? 021 and 76. So on our way to YYG, let's just go. We're YQY, 021 and 076. It only goes to the whole mile. There's not a way to put in tenths, I don't think. And then let's go to. Uh, YYG. So according to that plot, that, that, that point that we plotted, eh, we're a little bit right, of course, and we want to correct now left. Well, that says a 261, and, or does that say a 251? Yeah, that says we've, so we've, we've, we've maybe hit another area of wind that's blowing south to north. And of course, if we look at the way that this weather's tracking, that, that kind of makes sense, right? <clears throat> so if we're getting blown off course to the north, we'll go ahead and put in a course correction by about 15 degrees. Let's make sure, first of all, that we all are in agreement of the direction that we are flying. We're flying at a 261, I guess. That says we're flying at a 260, so we'll bump that up to a 261. We'll bump that up to a 261. 
But anyway, so we, we said we needed to correct to the left. Put about a 10 degree course correction in and then maybe another five for the wind. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to put in a full 20 degree left course correction because that's 10 degrees to get back one course and 10 degrees for the wind. Because we know we've been 10 degrees off course. If we're flying at 261 and that plot tells us we're, we, we tracked a 271, well then, man. And if we need to track now a 251, we need to be pointed at a 241. And then maybe to get back on the original course, really to turn to a 2-3-1. So we don't want to do this. What we want to do is more like this. We can kind of look for that island. Maybe, maybe we'll see it. But again, navigating by instruments, you can't count on what you can see. Yeah, maybe that might be it right there. <clears throat> navigating by instruments, you can't count on having uh, visual ground reference. distracted here for a moment. All right, anyway. <coughs> all right, guys. Throat's getting a little raspy after all this non-stop talking guys right, so obviously we weren't quite yet at the point where we were perpendicular but let's just go ahead and get ourselves another point bearing distances we aren't not are, are not yet receiving the VOR that we are trying to track toward let's get another point bearing distance off of Sydney VOR and see if our course correction has done us any good yet so we're currently what now at a 012s that look like maybe if that's a 10 there or is that a 10 yeah it's hard to tell we'll call that the 10 and that the 11 so we're at a 012 kind of got to wait kind of got to wait until we're at a whole mile. I mean, we can round it, but obviously then our position is going to be off by up to a half a mile. 
So let's just say it's 67.0 will be at uh, 011 and 67. And of course, I guess the reason that we're decreasing the distance is because we're pointed way more toward it now. 67, yeah, I'm sorry, 11, yeah, 011, and then uh, 67 miles. All right, so let's take YYG out of it. YQY 011067, and then YYG. Okay, so look, we got ourselves back on course we want to be on. So now we got a track of 263. So I think now we can go ahead and put ourselves pointed toward more of a 253 in order to achieve that. Yeah, there we go. And now that we're not making such a correction, we are now at the point where we presume we're tracking slightly away from that perpendicular point. But what that also tells us is that little island that we saw was probably indeed that one. So we, we did get a nice little cross-reference there. And we might be able to see this peninsula out to our left as well, or the northern shore of that island. Is, or is that an island, or is that, that might be mainland, actually. I guess technically it's an island. There's the Newfoundland Island there, and this, this may... Yeah, I guess if that river cuts through, that's technically an island. Do we see the, the, the northern tip of it? I guess that's that might be it. But still, again, and the good thing, the nice thing about what we're doing here, what does it tell us? That the distance to the uh, distance to that next VOR is 130 miles. So every point-bearing distance we plot off of Sydney, Sky Vector is going to tell us the distance remaining to Charlottetown. So really, really super powerful mapping tool is, uh, is that point-bearing distance reference. <laughs> IFR pilotage says pick a five string. Yeah, now we're yeah, yeah on the slant alpha stream we totally make stuff up, man. A peak at the ground is worth a thousand cross checks, exactly. No, and well the funny thing is, is I I trust <laughs> I I trust this more than I trust this. Because at least this, I know, is definitely this VOR, and we're at this distance from it. This, I don't know. I saw a little piece of land there. It might be that, or it might be that, or it might be that, or it might be that. <laughs> I mean, if we're really off base, it might be that. Uh, I doubt it's that. But I've, yeah, well, if we're really off base, it might be one of these. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I've done enough of this, you know, this kind of Oh, look at this. We got a signal, guys. And we're not that, we're not far off of it. And, uh, how, how close are we? 119? Yeah, okay, so all that worked out really well. Let's just do one last cross-reference just to show how well it does work. 60 for the 64.4 mile question. Um, 
Oh, and we're... We're at a 0, zero 1 or a zero, zero 2 Fall to zero, zero 1 and 64 miles. Of course, you can't put in 64.4. So... But let's say we could put in YQY 001064 just as a. And then uh, YYG. 119 miles. And what did it say we were? 117 now, yeah, but still. And what did it say we were? Slightly, slightly left, of course. And what does that say we are? Slightly, slightly left, of course. Yeah. Funny how that all works out, huh? Alright, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let auto take it from there, guys. But there you go. Anomalous, you asked and you have received. Well, good. And so now, we can really blank that out and just call our route Yemeti YYG. Not no, not TTG. Who knows where that's going? YYG. YYG. Please. Thank you. And then from there, it's. Uh, Victor 300 to Moncton. YQM. And then CYQM. So there's the rest of our route, guys. Still 243 miles to go, although, what do we know? We were uh, we were about 130 miles to go. 100 and, well, 120 miles to go. So we know that's 176, and we know we're at 100 and we're, we're 60 miles further down the line than, than that says. So that means we're about 180 miles from our destination. So that's, that's what, another hour and change flying? Hour and 15 minutes? That's about what I said it would be. And looks like the weather's still passing south to north. So it looks like we're still okay for our arrival. But that seems like it could still change so we'll keep our fingers crossed I think I heard Mr. Downwind Sim enter the chat there he is the infamous Goose Bay Moncton Triangle has it claimed another no sir we've made it through and out on the other side with a little help from our friend down here at Sydney so uh, we've, we've managed to keep ourselves pointed in the right direction 110 miles now inbound to Charlotte town and as a matter of fact since we no longer need Sydney for our little cross-reference game we can go ahead and tune the next station up the line which is that Moncton VOR on 117 th three excuse me interestingly enough guys I think our route started with a 117 three we have flown far enough that we've used two stations on the same frequency in the same flight that has probably happened before. Uh, good weather, yeah, goodish weather. It's held up. I mean, cloudy all the way. But it's held up, and uh, and hopefully, like I said, fingers crossed. If the weather at Moncton stays to the west and trends to the north, hopefully we'll be okay. And we've got some instrument approaches we can use at Moncton as well. We can actually start briefing that stuff. I mean, we've got. Another hour left before we're really going to start thinking about our arrival plan. But we can at least get the charts in front of us and start looking at what our options are going to be. Yeah, Anomalous says those storms were moving pretty fast on the eastern side. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. And the winds at our destination may not be too favorable. We'll see. <coughs> we did file an alternate of Halifax, which is down here to the south and east. 
So if we need it, we can go down and divert to there. Winds right now at our destination are reported as not too bad, 140 at 11. So fingers crossed that they stay reasonable. <laughs> At Downwind Sim says I flew into Goose Bay into in the B25. Yep, and uh, needed some anti-icing. Well, we've been kind of having that discussion all night long about you know how how this anti-icing system works and whether it's modeled accurately. We've 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 uh, we've come to the conclusion that it may well be. And it may, in fact, be something that we can run all the time because it, uh, it it seems like it is a cycling uh, boot inflation that cycles on its own. Yeah, <laughs> pick a five string. Because I'm flying the Saab 340 from Honolulu to Maui right now. So what is icing indeed? Well, you know, and well, I know, and I know you're joking, but and I, I doubt there's really any icing to worry about in that part of the world right now, even. But um, but yeah, no, it is. It, it's impressive how uh, quickly the temperature changes on on uh, on the climb. It's two degrees Celsius per thousand feet is the average. So and and again, and again, I know you were tongue in cheek, but just explaining for those who don't know this stuff. Um, so you figure, what's uh, what's a nice warm day on the surface? Um, 30 degrees, right? 30 degrees is what? Uh, 80s, mid 80s? What's 30 degrees, guys? Yeah, 30 degrees is mid 80s. So you get a nice mid 80s day on the surface. Well, at 15,000 feet, that's freezing already. So you can still get icing. Uh, you know, even on a pretty warm day. It is the AeroWorks Douglas DC-3. X plane 11. Getting really close downwind sim, getting really close to wrapping up this Douglas overseas tour. Of course, we've said for a couple of these episodes now, we're not even really overseas anymore. Well, I guess, I guess when we landed at Goose Bay, that's when we technically became not overseas anymore. But, um, but yeah, we got two more episodes after this one. We're going to land tonight at Moncton. The next episode in mid to late December will take us from Moncton down to Portland, Maine. And then the final episode of Douglas Overseas, which we'll do on New Year's Day, January 1st, will take us from Portland, Maine down to Danbury, Connecticut. We'll take another shot at that Darth, yeah, that uh, Death Star Trench approach to Runway 35 at Danbury. Try not to bounce it this time. And then head down to Baltimore. So that'll be our New Year's Day stream. We'll have some giveaways associated. And down when we were talking about all the ways that life and the stream are a different. Hawkman, <laughs> Hawk I missed that. Uh, I missed that message earlier. I'm sorry. I'm, I just I just glanced up and saw it. <laughs> Welcome back to the stream, by the way. I'll come back to it. Um, But anyway, yeah. So that so that January first stream, we'll be thinking a lot about how the how life has changed, and how the stream has changed since we started this series, which was back in March of 2020. And we were saying as soon as I said March of 2020, I'm sure a lot of you went, "Oh, well, yeah." <laughs> a lot's changed since March of 2020. But yeah, that was uh, that was right around the, the time that the series started. We our first episode of Douglas Overseas. We departed out of Baltimore, bounced it at Danbury, um, and then went up to Portland. 
was March 27th, so we had already kind of been in uh, shutdown, lockdown mode, and uh, for a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Andy, well, no, no. Douglas Overseas was my answer to, hey, what am I going to do with all this new free time? <laughs> and uh, and in both cases, it's dragged on a lot longer than I ever expected. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Um, we're talking about the ways in which life is different since this series began on March 27th of 2020. Um, but but outside of life, outside the sim world, there's a ton of ways that the stream has changed since then. So I was thinking about that, and I've started to list them out. And I think we I'm, I'm trying to come up with a fun way that would engage people who have been around the stream that long, and but but not... I don't want to be unfair or uncaring toward the people that haven't been around the stream that long to uh, come up with some fun giveaway ideas associated with thinking about some of the ways that the stream has evolved in that amount of time. And Melvin says, uh, I still claim that Flight Sim was one of the bright spots during this strange era. Yeah, absolutely, brother. With you on that. I mean, the ability to hop in a plane in a virtual world that is such an, such an incredible replication of the real one, but without politics and without disease and without, you know, mayhem and murder. You know, of course, I know there's DCS where you can bring some of those things back in if you want to, but for me, the ability to hop into this kind of a sim and fly along without any of those concerns, it's, it's, it's truly, uh, it's truly a remarkable retreat. And I'm, I'm happy to have it. And connect with others doing the same, says Melvin Leroy. I think that's probably the more important piece of it, even. I would say we are definitely in moisture, so let's just uh, be on the safe side, guys. The uh, indicated airspeed didn't really seem to flinch. Still wavering between 145, 150, so seemed to be okay. Where's, or is this mark 140, 145? So that's, yeah, right at 150. And Smitty says, I built my home sim cockpit just as the pandemic started, and it's been a lifesaver. Yeah, well, we've obviously we've made quite a few upgrades here as well. You know, again, with within, within the sim life and outside of the sim life here in the Slant Alpha household, lots of stuff has changed. And, uh, and like I said, we'll, we'll kind of. I, so I'm, I'm I, again. I don't know if I can I can do a giveaway associated with that, without inadvertently excluding people who haven't been around the stream as long. So I, I think. The giveaways may be landing rate related. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not, I haven't quite figured out exactly what I'm doing. But we definitely want to, 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 to spend the stream talking about all of the interesting ways in which the, the, the stream and the, the whole Slant Alpha thing it has evolved in that time. Yeah, Smitty says it's so much to learn and some great streamers to learn from, whoever they may be. If I think of one, I'll let you know. And, uh, and that sim gives you endless ways to escape. <laughs> well, Downwind Sim and Melvin Leroy teach us a lot, that's for sure. <laughs> no. I, I know, I, I know. I know, and I, I, I'm humbled by that, actually, but I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> and Smitty says, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with limiting scope to a giveaway. True. And I think that, um, 
I'm, I'm thinking of ways that we can do it that wouldn't just completely shut out people who haven't been around here for two years. You know, there's, there's probably ways to make it work. But certainly we'll have some fun on New Year's Day recounting all the ways that the stream has changed in the last year and nine months. And like I said, I've listed out, at, at, at when I posted it a couple days ago, it was 15 ways. I think it's now up to like 23 or 24 ways. Some of them major, some of them more subtle. That the stream has evolved since this series began in March of 2020. <laughs> Melvin says I specialize on what not to do, and Smitty says Melvin's awesome at showing me how to get unlost. Well, we've, we've done a fair amount of that on this stream, too. <laughs> and, uh, Hawkmed the Mad said earlier, All this manual navigation is making me tired. I'm not even doing it. That was the comment that I didn't see until late, and I just saw now where you were, like, uh, asking about the Death Star Trench approach. Yeah. So when we get down to Danbury, Connecticut, I wonder if I can show you. Go to the VFR map. How are we on our nav? You know what? I'll tell you what I probably should do real quick. Just see how we're doing on our aux tanks. Yeah, we still got 60, 65 gallons each, and then we got a bunch in the main, so we're good. I know we got a little flying left to do here, guys, but we're still good fuel-wise. Um, Danbury, Connecticut. So it's just north of the New York Bravo. Here we go. And it's, I guess it's not, maybe the New York's, are we too nor too far north for the New York tack, maybe? Yeah, it's too far n north for the New York tack chart. It's not real well depicted here on this chart, but maybe there's a picture, oh, I'd actually I know a good way to show you. But anyway, the approach to this runway, as you follow this road, it really comes through a nice little trench. And you kind of have to hug the terrain in order to, it's almost, it's not nearly as bad as, as uh, St. Bart's, where you really have to hug the hillside in order to put it down on the runway. But it's like St. Bart's light, if you will. And, uh, when I, when I flew up here from Baltimore, we were doing it at VFR, and I kind of came in from a funky angle, and I, I was going to, I was going to, what did I do? I was going to do an overfly, and then, uh, and I can't remember what I planned to do, but I suddenly went, oh, I'll just, I'm on a left base, I'll just fly a left base. And, uh, just didn't get stable in time, and really just, really embarrassed myself, actually. You gotta go back to uh, March 27th of 2020 to see that, but let's let's do that. Willow's 4387 is here. Willow, how are you? Welcome back to the stream. 73 miles to go into uh, Charlotte Town, VOR, and everything hunky dory. Uh, cylinder head temps are creeping up just a little bit. Uh, everything else looking good. We'll just we'll open up the cow flaps just a touch. Oops. Alright, well, I know exactly how to show you. In-flight entertainment, yeah. Well, <laughs> let's search. And what is it? I think it's DXR. Yeah, Douglas Overseas begins. This is the one.
Uh, oh, and that was... Um, oh, here it is. Perfect. So, uh, so let's back it up just a little bit. So you come down, and so there's the road that goes through the little valley there, and then the airport's like dead ahead. So there you go, decent view of it there. And again, on this on this version of the this first first attempt, I wound up going around. Um, So you, you just got a little, you just, just got a little hit of something that's a little bit different on the stream. Um, but look at this, um, look at this approach, guys. I'm a little nervous not looking in the cockpit of my actual currently sim flying plane. <laughs> yeah, now watch watch how badly I set this up. You could see well first of all you could see that I was too high and coming in too steep. Any volume to the video? Um it's still going to be hard to hear. I don't have to go around yet. Oh, yeah, oh, bad, 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 bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to go around. We're going around, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Let's skip ahead a little bit. There we go. So now we're deeper into the trench. Looking much better this time, though. All right, this one's going to look a lot better, I think. Deeper into the trench, but we set it it's up a lot. Yeah, a lot l no less. Drastic power adjustments to. Yeah, uh, there we go. The rest of the set, right? Yeah. As soon as I knew I was going to have to do that, that should have been my clue to just go around. <laughs> this would be much better. Yeah. That's how we should have looked the first time, 121. That's what we'll go with. Yeah, so that was, that was my uh, embarrassing first trial into Danbury on the very first episode of this. Now, I had flown the DC-3 numerous times before that. But yeah, that was uh, that was pretty impressively bad. Oh, mommy makeouts, by the way. So I'm looking at the message you sent. Yeah, it was, and that the bot timed you out. I hope that you're still here. You're you're more than welcome to stick around and join the chat. We just do we just do try to watch the language. But no, it was exactly what you said it was. <laughs> yeah, no doubts, no doubts. But yeah, hoping to redeem ourselves. Now, like I said, even in that same very stream, made a uh, much better go of it the second time around. But did you notice how deep you have to be in that trench in order to set up a nice, stable, not too steep approach? So it's it's really uh, an easy one to, to botch if you're not really hugging the terrain. Like I said, not quite as bad as St. Bart's, but you know, definitely in that same kind of mindset to do it. So we'll, we'll, we'll make another run out of it on New Year's Day and hopefully do uh, hopefully do a job better to that, closer to that second attempt than that first one.
Yeah, Smitty says I just try to burn the speed off and get her down. Try to get trying to get better about making more realistic calls like that. Yeah, and if believe me, you guys. You guys saw my marathon stream that ended in Honolulu. Sometimes, as a sim pilot, it's just like effort. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm not going around. I'm just not. I don't feel. I don't have it in me. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just make the best of it. Yeah, the length of the field plays into that. Well, and sometimes, sometimes it's just like whatever. I'm gonna put her down, and if we end up in a backyard, we end up in a backyard. I try not to be that way, but trust me. Like tonight, we're landing. We're landing this on the first attempt tonight. I'm going to put that out there now. <laughs> All right, still 54 miles. Uh, I think it's probably past due time to uh, <laughs> yeah pick up high string. Not an ideal thing for the passengers to hear you say. Hopefully the uh, hopefully the flight deck door is still closed. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully they didn't hear that. <laughs> you guys good back there? Yeah, I don't know. I just heard some weird stuff from coming from the, the, the pilot, but hopefully it was my imagination. <laughs> back, yeah, back in the day when it was a curtain and not a door. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so what I was saying was... <laughs> what I was saying was it's it's high time we start planning our arrival. Melvin's planning on flying with us on the last leg. Yes, yeah, a new, nice New Year's Day stream. Hopefully that hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to hang out with with uh, a lot of our longtime friends that day. That'll be cool. Thanks, uh, thanks Melvin. Have a good one, man. Um, anyway, so like I was saying before probably well past due the time that we should start thinking about our descent and arrival into Moncton. So first things first, let's get a weather briefing there, see what the current conditions are. We know that it is still more than possible that the conditions there will change. We think we have, uh, what do we got, 50 miles to this VOR, and then we've got 61 miles. So we're about a little more than 100 miles out. So a little bit more than a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes out. So we're still a little on the early side. Yeah, the North Atlantic and Canadian flying has been the most extreme part, part of the tour, it seems, says Chuck Lee. Yeah, and, and the fact that it's you know, falling in the wintertime isn't helping matter. The flying in Greece was mild and scenic. Well, yeah, some of it. <laughs> I was just looking at one of the highlights we saved on Twitch, and uh, it was scenic, but not all of it was mild. <laughs> anyway, so where are we going? CYQM? Yeah, oh, it's starting to get a little dicey there. 170 at 10, so the wind is still not too bad. 12 statute miles, light rain. And look at how low that altimeter setting is, 29.34. Some nice low pressure situation happening there. Temperature 7, so not, uh, not too extreme in that regard, but we can definitely see. And, and we see, we, and we knew, I mean, we know, we knew coming in that there's a pretty significant weather system just to the west of the airport. And we're going to, you know, maybe get clipped by a couple of these little bands. What's the, uh, what was the cloud cover? Let's skip over that. Broken at 2600. Okay, so we're still, 
well, still doable from an, uh, an instrument approach standpoint here. Peebles here. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, you missed it earlier. I missed it. Yeah, low pressure isn't usually great flying conditions. Well, yeah, low pressure is usually associated with exactly what we're seeing, which is kind of like extreme weather changes. Um, yeah, hurricanes are hurricanes are uh, the lowest pressure temp the lowest pressure readings that you normally see are associated with hurricanes. Got in a little late from the uh, bowling night, says people. Yeah, there you go, says Hawkman. Yep, that's kind of the way it works. Generally speaking, not not a hundred percent, but that's a pretty reliable rule of thumb for sure. Um, anyway, so like I said, the next step would be to figure out what options we have from a runway standpoint. If we go C Y Q M, open that up, Let's see what we have here from. Uh, Oh, this was the one that I don't think my scenery had the full length of this runway. I think my scenery cut this runway off about here. So we might have to keep that in mind, guys. There's the air terminal. So what's down here? Control tower. Moncton Flight College is apron four. Doesn't really say itinerant aircraft wishing to use apron eight. Need to contact security. Oh, apron eight is the commercial terminal. Okay. So it seems like general aviation, kind of down here in in this area, probably. But this is apron eight is where the you know commercial facility is and passenger terminal and all that stuff. So I think we'll maybe. We'll just we'll just presume that we've got ourselves permission to park up here at the passenger terminal because we are VIPs after all. I don't know about me, but you all, you all are. <laughs> um, and so, if the wind is one seven zero, I guess our best bet from a runway standpoint is two four. That's the one that I don't think I have the full length of in the scenery, but. Hopefully, we'll have at least the approach. And we got an ILS to six. We got a VOR to two four. Johnny Martarena with the follow. Thank you so much. We got a VOR approach, and those are always fun. And we're going to be coming off of the Moncton VOR anyway. We're going to be coming from the north and west, so I think we can probably skip the procedure turn. We're going to be coming, I guess, probably from this direction. So I think, honestly, instead of having to do the full approach, we will plan on being 3,000 at 7 miles out and kind of, kind of, kind of put ourselves on a straight in no procedure turn type situation. I don't know how legit that is from a procedural standpoint in Canada, but you know we could just kind of say we're getting vectored to it from the approach controller, or who knows? I mean, you know, we've taken some liberties here for sure. Um, 
but a 117.3 out on a 2.45, and that's kind of what we'll call it. So we need to be 3,007 miles prior to the VOR, so that's kind of informing <coughs> on our top of the set as well. All right, so. Let's plan our descent. Yeah, again, so we're coming in coming in straight from the... It wouldn't make any sense. I mean, we could, really, if we wanted to. It wouldn't make any sense to try and swing all the way down here so that we could go out here and, and you know, do the procedure turn and then turn and then turn back in. Wouldn't be any benefit to doing that. But we could. I don't know... I don't know how it works in Canada. Chugley was, was uh, so VFR. I think you mean V O. Do you mean V O R there, Chugley? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So no, all right, yeah. We're we're not VFR. We're flying an instrument approach. So that's. I mean, I agree with her on that. The same thing in the U.S. You don't want to do straight in um, VFR because you're cutting off aircraft that are in the pattern. So. Um, you know, as you arrive into the airport area, you don't want to make everyone sequence to you. You you need you should sequence to them. Um, but this is this is not a this is not VFR. This is an instrument approach. So what I don't know is. Oh well, well, actually, hold on. I take it back. I take it back, because there is a marking on the chart that says if we start from Bimku, so if we have a way to navigate to Bimku. There is a marking on the chart that says exactly what I was just saying, which is... You don't need to make the procedure turn. So, question is, do we have the ability to IFR route ourselves to BIMQ? Is BIMQ on any chart? No, not not on well, not not on the Sky Vector IFR low chart, at least. So what I have a feeling we're going to end up doing is when we get to about this point, we'll just break off and intercept the 065 outbound at a distance of more than seven miles, and then we'll just come in that way. Is that totally legit? No, but if we had an approach controller, they could vector us that way. So that's what we're simulating here. Again, you got to take some liberties when you're flying IFR without air traffic control. So we'll, we'll, we'll air traffic control ourselves onto that approach. Since it's been a little while, how close are we? We're still 25. Smitty says a VFR entry isn't exactly cutting everyone else off. Is it commonly viewed that way? If you're making a, v a VFR straight in, uh, it's yes, it's considered bad form. So, and this is a completely different topic than what we're doing on this stream tonight. Um, but let's just briefly discuss it since it came up. Uh, let's go to a, a VFR. I like to use Ocean City, Maryland as my... Uh, go to a VFR chart. Ocean City, Maryland. Okay. So we got runway 32 at Ocean City, Maryland. Well, actually, 32 is a bad example because you're coming in off the. Well, no, 32s. I think 32 is this one. Yeah. All right. So let's say. Oh, no, that's 02 and 20. So this is runway 02. Let's say the active at Ocean City, Maryland is, is runway 2. All right. And we're coming in from the south. We're coming up. Uh, 
coming up Assateague VFR. Non-towered field. So we're coming from the south, and we're like, all right, cool. We're coming right up the beach, coming right up the Assateague Bay, and we're going to basically just be on a straight in to runway two. All right. Um, and we start making our calls 10 miles out. 514 Delta Victor, uh, 10 miles south, uh, runway two straight in. Well, at the same time, there's somebody who just joined the downwind to the left 40. Yeah, yeah, the left. Uh, yeah, the, the the left 45 to the downwind. So now we're coming in from this direction. We're co they're coming in from this direction. We're forcing somebody who did a proper entry to sequence to us. So we're forcing them to extend out or 360 or do something to adjust to us because we're coming straight in. You know, whereas, you know, if we did the proper thing, you know, here's runway two. And we're down here. And somebody's coming in this way. Well, by, re by, all, by all right away rules, they're in the pattern first. And if, and if we enter just from straight in, we've, we've just cut them off. So what we really need to do is swing out to the east, overfly, and either join in behind them this way or do the teardrop and join in behind them that way. But just to come straight in and force them to sequence to us, is it's, it's considered bad form. So yeah, that's that's what that's what I think, I think, kind of the scenario Chugley was referring to, I think, if I understood his message, but that's not what we're dealing with tonight. Tonight we are dealing with an instrument procedure. An instrument procedure in which the procedure clearly says that if you join from this point out here seven miles out you can go straight in without having to perform the procedure turn but it doesn't really specify what happens if you're arriving at the VOR from the west do you have to swing out and do the procedure turn or can you turn directly on the final this procedure I don't think really says but I don't know the Canadian rules as to what applies there you know what I mean? So, but again, this this is this is a not uh, this is not a. Uh, I mean, this is a towered field, and we we would presume that we would have an approach controller on. So the approach controller could vector us and intercept that final approach course, or they could clear us to go direct Moncton and join the final approach course. So again, with air traffic control, you basically just you're you're able to do whatever they clear you to do. But if you're flying this procedure raw, do you have to make the procedure turn if you're arriving at Moncton, or do you, or would you only have to yeah, or would you not have to do the procedure turn only if you've somehow had had joined the uh, approach at BIMQ? I, I don't know. For purposes of tonight, like I said, we're just basically going to vector ourselves out to this direction and just intercept that 245 inbound maybe further out who knows so some liberties that we're definitely taking tonight but that's that's what I was getting at ring police is with us ring police how are you welcome by the way after all that discussion, we're 12 miles away from that Charlottetown VOR. And let's go back to the low. After Charlottetown, it's a 282, 61 miles. Excellent. Them's my shoes is here. If liberties will not be granted, sometimes they must be taken. You sound like you're about to start a revolution, man. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, Hawkmed says, I read it as though you would be coming from further north to get to that point. Yeah, I do too. And that's why I was looking at the low IFR chart to see if is there like an airway that that point is on or anything like that. It doesn't look like it. So I don't know. Like I said, we're uh, we're gonna just we're gonna fudge it a little bit. That's all. What's the black line going over the water? Uh, uh, not sure which one you mean. We'll have to come back to it because I want to. First of all, I need to get on that 285 westbound. 282, rather. 282 westbound. And then I need to start my descent planning. On the world level. We'll come back to it, Hawkman. So we need to be at 3,007 miles prior to Moncton. We're at 10,000, so we got 7,000 to lose. I like to use three and a half miles per thousand. Times, uh, I said three and a half point. Three, what's, what's wrong with my three button? So we're gonna start that descent 24.5 miles prior to where we need to be down at three. But remember, we need to be at three prior to seven miles out from the VOR. So we need to start that descent 31 miles from the VOR. It's a 61 mile leg, so we need to start the descent essentially at the same time we transition from navigating west to Charlottetown to uh, inbound to Moncton. All right, so we got that good to go. Uh, I think we need to maybe put it in heading mode here for a second and I don't know what the plane's doing as far as trying to get us on a... We'll just set it for a 240 exactly. What's the outbound? 282. All right, let's get that set. All right, so there's the outbound we need to be on. We're not in any mode now. Ladies and gentlemen, the zigzaggy turns that we're experiencing right now are completely normal. Please do not be alarmed. All right, so we're gonna miss the VOR slightly to the north, but that's okay. Right now, what I need to focus on first is, yeah, that, that exactly why I was doing that exercise. So we're really flying a two, Six eight or two six nine right now. All right, passing the VOR. We'll worry about shaking out on that 282 here in just a moment, but first of all, <laughs> get all of our instruments into agreement as to which way we are pointing, which is 270 exactly. Alright, and we do need to 
stay on a 270 until the 282 comes in. We might even need to correct a little bit left. Is that needle moving? Not yet. Still pegged all the way to the left. We may need to... Uh, I can't imagine. With, with the angle that thing is behind us, I can't imagine we need to correct further to the left. Unless the wind is that severe. Maybe it is. That's scary. <laughs> Still nothing on the needle. All right, let's go another 10 degrees. So there's more than a 30 degree correction to the left. Still not seeing that needle budge. That is crazy. Captain Aviator with the raid. Okay, now that needle's starting to move. Not moving that quickly, though. I and mean, we must have a vicious wind blowing south to north. And of course, we, looking at the weather chart, we knew that was probably the case. While we're waiting for that VOR to finish coming in, Captain Aviator, thanks so much for the raid. We appreciate it. Hope that you had a good flight tonight. And looks like our aux tanks are just about down to uh, 35 gallons apiece. All right. Well, we've got a little bit left, but when we start our descent, we will certainly want to go ahead and switch to the mains. So that is good. Trying to have a good flight, but uh, flights in 2020 being crappy, I'm sorry. It, it can do that sometimes, man. All right, let's go ahead and pop it back into nav mode as we finally have intercepted that radial. And look at the look at the angle of that wind correction it's got us on. We're turned well 12 degrees south in order to stay on that airway. That is crazy. That is crazy, guys. Let's <laughs> Let's get an updated weather report at our destination. Doesn't it seem like that's a good idea? Uh, looks like it's the exact same observation. Uh, the th December 3rd at 0400. So what, what was that? It was 11? No, that was 10 p.m. Eastern, right? No, it was 11. 11 p.m. Eastern. Okay, so we're coming up on due for an updated observation. Yeah, so Chugly, it pulls the ones from VATSIM, but in theory, VATSIM is using real-world conditions, so... 
probably all pulling from the same database. The other thing you can do is uh, the weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. Anyway, all right. Enough fun and games, guys. We got we got a plane to land. Let's make our navigation transition and let's head inbound toward the VOR 117.3. So let's go ahead and put it into heading mode for now. Let's match up our heading first of all. Which should be there, right? One seventeen three. Let's run through the approach briefing, approach frequency and course. Uh, where's my navigraph chart? 117.3 and 245. And uh, yeah, we can go ahead and set. I'm going to go ahead and set 245 now. Even though we're basically just headed toward the VOR at the moment. We're going to that's going to change here in just a minute. Um missed approach. Three thousand and two four one to the Riverview NDB. So 304, we'll get that set. What is that? 304? And I think it's at 3,000. Yep, 3,000 straight out to 241 to... Uh, the NDB, right hand hold once we get there. Uh, so we got yeah, missed yeah, approach, approach frequency and course, missed approach frequency and course. Uh, minimums would be a good thing to know. Minimums for the VOR. Five hundred eighty. We'll say six hundred for uh, round figures. We do want to set the altimeter twenty nine thirty four. We are a bit lower than we believe we are. That's a good thing to know. Oh, and of course I should have done that way more gently because now the plane's going to pitch up radically to get back up to that ten. <laughs> Whoops. I always forget that. Alright, but let's continue the briefing and then we gotta start getting ready to fly the plane. Uh, approach frequency and course, missed approach frequency and course, minimums. We talked about the forecast winds, so on a 2 4, it's gonna be coming from 1 7, so it would be a left to right, so we'll correct to the left. Ceiling window is about 2600 or thereabouts. Missed approach procedure we talked about straight ahead 3,000 uh, 3, to the NDB. 
and anticipated turn off will be a right hand turn off off of runway 24. Okay, so our briefing is done. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just about to start our descent into Moncton, so we ask that you return to your seats and fasten your seat belts. Weather there is currently in the mid 40s with uh, cloudy skies and light rain. The cabin crew is going to come around one last time to collect trash and take care of any last minute needs. Thanks again for flying with us on Slant Alpha Airways. C. George says, how many more legs? Well, if you mean for, for tonight, zero. Um, if you mean for the Douglas Overseas Tour, two more episodes, three more legs. We're going to go from Moncton to Portland in the next episode, mid to late December. And then uh, New Year's Day, we'll go Portland to Danbury, Connecticut, and Danbury, Connecticut to Baltimore. <clears throat> I am going to... Uh, Go ahead and switch back to the main tanks. Yeah, counting the one that we're currently on, yes, but the, the one that we're currently on is pretty much over. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make it my airplane, guys. That does mean I'm probably going to fall behind in the chat here, but... Uh, Hope that you bear with me on that. We got uh, twenty and twenty set. I'm I am intentionally starting a gentle right turn because we are going to kind of swing up to the north of that VOR and catch it. Catch it north and east on that 245 or that 065 outbound. The people says, I don't know if I could take more tonight. The DC-6 is always a little intense. Well, this is uh, only half of a DC-6 there, uh, people. But yes, doesn't make it half as intense, I agree. Finish. I got Red Bull number three for the night, guys. Who had the over under? <laughs> uh, I wish to fly a three zero zero. Again, in reality, we would have a approach controller vectoring us to intercept that final. Today, we're just going to vector ourselves here. Got a few more things to do on the descent. We're a little early. So I'm not going to worry about them just yet. And it's a little early for landing rate predictions. Smitty just sent a paragraph while I'm on approach and hand flying. Smitty, I'm going to have to come back to that one. <laughs> yeah, I know that nav point was only seven miles out since people. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm drifting further to the right than I intend to be. I'm, I'm trying to trying to maintain about a three zero zero heading here. Do you want to go ahead and 
Well, no, we don't want to open up cow flaps just yet. Cylinder head temps are nice and cool. <laughs> That's right. We're unable your direct man. Don't you know who we are? <laughs> Uh, so cut up on seven thousand. We need to get down to three. So we're not in any rush yet. We still got a few miles to go. But I will go ahead and get the mixture enriched. Cows up and into uh, into trail. And I think I'm being blown even further to the north. You can see the angle to the VOR there and that yellow arrow right kind of dead center just above the NDB tuner. The yellow arrow to the VOR is pretty far off to the left as I was heading a 300. So I'm probably getting blown even more to the north than I intended to be coming into that VOR from, so to Peebles point, I don't want to I don't want to swing too far up to the north and get that. I only only need to be seven miles off. Twenty miles now. Um, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and commence our approach, guys. The uh, tailwheel is locked. Go ahead and get the fuel pumps on. Now yeah, we're getting some rain. Anti-icing is on. De-icing, really, but we had that conversation earlier. You guys can start putting some predictions into the chat. As far as the uh, vertical descent rate upon touchdown, there's no bot command on this channel for that. Winner gets an automatic entry into our monthly landing rate raffle to be drawn on the 29th of December closest predictor in either direction above or below is the one that gets that entry again no bot command minus sign is even optional we know you meet a descent rate And last call will be as we pass 1,000, uh, ooh. Nose up a little bit, and I don't mean to do that. Kind of on that, uh, that 245 course, too. So we need to start edging this. Edging this heading down to 245. Plus or minus whatever the wind correction is. And again, if the wind is coming 170, we need to be correcting to the left. So we'll aim to fly out about like that. We're at 4,500. 15 miles to go. We need to be at 3,000. 
seven miles to go, and then what's our what's our altitude over the VOR? Oh, starting to get some. Uh, It's like 2010, if I'm reading that correctly. I don't know. It's 2010? Yeah, 2010, I think, is the uh, target altitude over the VOR. So we'll bring it down to uh, 3,000, level it out. I'm not going to add too much power back in. I'm going to increase the prop speed, but I'm not going to add too much power back in because I do want to start slowing the, the airplane down. We're 11 miles out, so we got some time. Lateral adherence to the final approach course has been pretty good. <laughs> Happy with that. Well, we're sinking below our target altitude of three. Let's get the props back up to 24. Keep this to keep the uh, manifold pressure down. Hundred and twenty knots. Put flaps one in, but I don't want to don't want to really slow down any further because we're not really going to start descending until we're maybe about three and a half miles from the VOR. Because at the VOR we're supposed to be at 2,010 feet. I guess I should make a call. <laughs> Moncton traffic, Douglas 514 Delta Victors of DC-3, nine miles northeast of Moncton VOR on the VOR 24 approach, Moncton. Yeah, we got traffic here, interesting. Gonna listen out to that call and when he makes his next one kind of figure out where he is and maybe we make a right 360 for spacing or who knows I've wandered a little bit off of my lateral course here so I'm gonna come back to the left Interesting indeed, says Chuckley. Yeah, somehow that did sound like a familiar voice. Oh, and I got the uh, I got the labels on. Well, let's turn those off. Two hundred feet low.
Yeah, we're we're passing Bimku. We're six miles out, so we're a mile past Bimku. No, I know it was, Smitty. I know it wasn't you. Let's get back up to uh, let's get back up to three thousand, and let's get back over on our lateral course. We're back on the lateral course. I'm going to dial out some of the correction. Still a little low. We're still supposed to be at 3,000. Three and a half now until the VOR. Put in a gentle descent. Aim to be at 2010 over the VOR. As we're descending on glide slope, we'll go ahead and get gear down. Flaps two under 100 knots. We'll add some power. We don't want to don't want to slow down too much just yet. Don't get have the field in sight. Kind of about to go Kona Confusion over the VOR here. Alright, 2,000 feet. Alright, let's keep 2,000 until we're over the VOR. I got down a little early. passing underneath of us. Lateral guidance needs to be ignored for just a moment. <clears throat> Moncton traffic, Douglas 514, Dr. Victor over Moncton VOR on the VOR 24 approach. Five mile final. Moncton. <clears throat> Laps three and ninety knots. Remember, last 
last call is going to be a thousand for the uh, predictions, guys. We're at fourteen hundred, so keep those predictions coming. Don't yet have the field in sight. Lateral approach here and adherence looks pretty good. Minimums are going to be six hundred. So he's going to land and hold short 2-9. Okay, well then we're fine. Alright, I feel like I kind of have the airport in sight, but I don't quite see the runway. About a two mile final. We should be at about a thousand feet. Yeah, we're good. Is that a runway up there? Okay, I see it. All right, flaps 480 knots. Gears down and green. Flaps set and checked. Right hand turn off. Straight out to, to 3,000 if we go missed. So we can see where the runway ends in the ortho, and it doesn't match up with the, where the runway ends in the actual scenery, so. There we go. Okay, I think I've corrected for it now. Flight to traffic, uh, Freaker T12 is clear of the runway vacated via Bravo. happy with it overall 94 is the number as soon as I turn the tail as soon as I unlock the tail wheel we're once we wants to fishtail but uh, do I need a 180 Moncton traffic, Douglas 514, Delta Victor's down, runway 24. Looks like we're going to need a 180 and backtrack to the terminal, Moncton.
Uh, so I know that the scenery that I have is, doesn't quite line up with what's actually here, so... Again, we're taking some liberties. But I was happy with the runway, or the landing at least. Ernest Gann would be proud. Is that uh, is that the stick and rudder author? <laughs> That's kind of all we had. All we had to go on. Yeah, I remembered. When we uh, when we landed here previously, that the oh, fate is the hunter. Okay, I got you. <laughs> All right, very good. Parking brake on. Well, we would have uh, off the runway. We would have cleaned up. We would have done the uh, flaps stowed. Uh, anti collisions off. Landing lights on, taxi light, or landing lights off, taxi light would have come on with a landing clearance, uh, but we can turn it off now that we're at the terminal. So pito heat, and then the fuel pumps, and then the uh, cowls would have come open, opens this way. And then uh, now that we're parked, we can go taxi light off, parking brake on. You earned your overtime pay tonight, says Anomalous. Uh, I know there's a f some stuff in the chat that I definitely missed. I don't, uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get back to some of those messages. So Smitty, um, I know that somebody, I guess, picked up the conversation, but feel free to join us in the uh, Discord with whatever it was that you were asking, and we'll probably catch up on that conversation tomorrow. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get the uh, so tailwheel unlocked, flap stowed. Uh, Anti-collision landing lights, pito heat, anti-icing. Yeah, that can come off also. The, uh, let's see, what else? Yep, everything else is done. Taxi light off, parking brake on, tailwheel can be relocked, which did I do? Okay, that is now relocked. Uh, transponder can come off. We'll set it to 1200 and shut it off there. And we will go ahead and, uh, go ahead and shut her down, boys, shut her down. Mix magnetos and generators. Get the seatbelt signs off. There we go. Get the doors open for you. Let's see. What else can we do here? We'll check on our fuel and ETA. I uh, feel like the ETA worked out pretty well. The ETA worked out very well. Remember, we got off almost exactly on time, too. 15 after on the ground, 20 after on the blocks. Bam! Uh, should have 221 gallons left over, uh, a.k.a. 1324 pounds. Let's just skip some of the pageantry here and check it in pounds. 1324 is what I counted on. Uh, we were way more fuel efficient than I intended to be. 1,700 pounds left over, so... Yeah, I might need to make an adjustment to those consumption numbers, but uh, but yeah, it worked out pretty well. All right, who was the big winner? As we uh, back out and check through the chat, the, the uh, touchdown vertical descent rate was 94. So who was close? Hawkmed gave us a 114. Is that going to be closest? 100 was them's my shoes. Is anybody closer than them's my shoes? No, I guess that's it. Them's my shoes picks up another one. Man, 
Perfect. Well done, sir. Well done. So, uh... Very good. Okay, well, I, again, we'll pick up the conversation. Uh, Smitty, if you want to resume the conversation that you started in the chat that I didn't get a chance to see, please feel to, to copy and paste it into the Discord or uh, just pick up the conversation tomorrow. Um, let us uh, finish the shutdown of the plane. I do want to do a couple of replays of the landing. I was pretty happy with it. <laughs> if anybody put in a, a guess, guess that was closer than 100, please let me know. But I think it's them, my shoes that got it. Let's go ahead with prop and throttle levers down. We'll get the radio master and inverter off if I can uh, get the view rotated to where it needs to be. No smoking light can come off. Beacon and nav lights can come off. Hawk meds taken off. The uh, fuel tanks can be shut off here. All right. There's that. There's that. Get the cowls closed, and that's that up button there. Master battery switch. And then we'll close her up from the outside. There we go. All right. Well, there you go, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, Moncton, Canada. Two more episodes left of Douglas Overseas. And we're going to finish the series up on New Year's Day. It's an honor to be dumb and lucky. Well, I uh, I can vouch. <laughs> I can personally vouch. Thanks for being with us, guys. It's Douglas Overseas, our mini-series here that's just about uh, wrapped up. we got two more episodes to go. We'll, uh, we'll take this plane from here to Portland, Maine. And then uh, that'll be the next episode, which, which will happen mid to late December. And then on uh, New Year's Day, we go from Portland, Maine, Danbury, Connecticut, to Baltimore, Maryland to wrap this thing up. It's going to be 33 total episodes in all by the time we finish it out. If you are brand new to the stream and you want to know what's coming up in the short term, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. The link's down there at the bottom. We're Slant Alpha on both of those venues, so feel free to... Uh, to follow us there if you uh, want to see the full show schedule it's down there underneath the about tab under the picture window here on twitch you can also find it on our facebook page we also have it posted over on our discord server the discord server is open to anybody who wants to jump in on the conversation uh, again especially during the uh, descent i wasn't quite as responsive to the chat messages as i had my hands full with the plane but uh certainly didn't mean to ignore anybody and you're more than welcome to uh to pop over into the Discord just to say hi or to ask questions or to pick up a discussion that we were having here in the chat tonight or uh, ask any other questions you may have or whatever, whatever, just, just shoot the breeze. You're more than welcome to join for whatever reason you would like into the conversation over there, which I monitor more or less 24-7 when I'm not streaming or sleeping. The uh, last link to point out is the YouTube channel that the, down at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, and that's where we archive all of our old flight broadcasts. So if you want to see more of that first Douglas Overseas episode where we bounced that first landing into Connecticut and made what somebody called a dog s landing, which you guys probably didn't see that message, but I did. And it was. I agree completely. Um, but uh, you can check that out or any of our old flight broadcasts, uh, which are over there on the YouTube channel. But... Uh, Probably more usefully, we have a VAT Sim Tutorials playlist over there where if you notice those uh, prediction numbers that I had for my fuel and flight time and you want to see how I come up with those, you can uh, check out the tutorial there on the VAT Sim Tutorials playlist. We've also got some guides on how to figure out what to say to air traffic control or how to put a route together, IFR or VFR, uh, how to read VFR sectionals. We have a, uh, one that uh, talks about what these slant codes mean, slant alpha, slant lima, slant golf, all that fun stuff. So uh, please feel free to check any of those tutorials out, ask questions in the comments, or find us in the Discord if you have questions about anything there, uh, as always. Coming up next on the show, we are going to be off on our normal stream day tomorrow, which would be Friday the 3rd, but Saturday the 4th, it is ZDC Live. It's the Capital Christmas event hosted by Washington ARTCC on VATSIM. We're going to be staffing up Dulles, DCA, and BWI. I will be working... Dulles Tower will all be collected together and uh, controlling from an undisclosed location down in Roanoke, Virginia. 
And uh, again, we've been told to expect some questionable Wi-Fi connectivity issues there. So we'll see what happens. We'll do our best to broadcast uh, live from that event. It should be a good time. Uh, mixture will be fully enriched, I guarantee. And uh, we'll be controlling Dulles Tower if I didn't say that already. So join us Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Midnight Zulu on Sunday morning for that. Our typical flight schedule is Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So, uh, check out that full show schedule, like I said, down there underneath. Oh, Mike, am I going to have a stuck mic? That is... How am I transmitting? My radios are off. So I don't even know how that's working. Anyway, we'll just disconnect. So thank you for letting me know, Charlie. Anyway, what was I saying? But, um... Yeah, but anyway, that full show schedule down there underneath the About tab or over on our Discord server or on our Facebook page. Alright, that's going to wrap it up. Let's go ahead and check out a couple replays here, guys. Uh, already disconnected from the network, which uh, X-Pilot would do anyway as soon as it puts us into uh, replay mode here. Yeah, there we go. We'll take it from there. That looks pretty good. And we get a tower view. That's an in-plane view. How far out? Oh, yeah, there we go. That's not looking bad at all. iOS says it's bad timing for that event. I'll be watching the Big Ten Championship. Ah, of course. <laughs> I hope that you don't mind that I intercepted you from Moncton. Uh, or if, yeah, intercepted you at Moncton, says Charlie. Nah, I never mind flying along, man. That was, uh, it's always, always a challenge to realize you're on a uh, conflicting IFR approach with somebody and then figure out what to do about it. Turkey Lips Gaming with that follow just a few moments ago. Appreciate you stopping in and checking us out tonight. Hope that you, uh, will catch us again soon. Again, we do VETSIM air traffic control on this network on the, at the, at the delivery ground and tower level. Mostly tower. Most often tower. Working Dulles Tower for you two days from now. Uh, but we're mostly a general aviation flying stream. And again, we focus the channel on this old school radio-based navigation. So let's speed this replay up just a little bit, guys. Didn't realize I picked it up from so far out. This is allegedly the tower view, although it doesn't seem like it's very elevated. But we'll check it out from here and we'll do another couple of views here. Yeah, tiny little, tiny little bounce, right? Yeah, tiny little bounce, not too bad though. Tell you what, that's not too bad for a Douglas landing. Let's do what our friend Melvin calls the uh, trespass review. There, did I already miss it? Okay, yeah, that one's not going to work out. Too far up the runway. How were we on center line with it? Yeah, a little right of center line, but the crosswind we had, I'm not going to begrudge myself that too bad. And then one more. And again, you can see the ortho mismatch with the... Uh, with the scenery here. Oh, mama, we're almost home. Yeah, so aiming blocks went by a little bit ago. <laughs>
Yeah, that's not too bad. We'll take that any day of the week. We'll take it, guys. Yeah, not too bad. Never get tired of seeing a wing view out of a DC-3, says Trugly. Yeah, we had lots of real estate, Smitty. Indeed. All right, guys. Well, thank you, thank you again for uh, for checking us out tonight. So we have a have a view we can use. Where are we? Oh, are we looking at the other runway? That's why the view's so off. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. As we make our way back in, we'll go ahead and wrap up, guys. Again, we'll uh, hope to see you Saturday evening from our uh, ZDC Live event. Thank you for stopping in and uh, checking us out tonight. Let's see if, who I can find that is uh, looking like they're still going to be on for a little bit. Uh, can't tell. Oh, I know exactly who I'm sending you to. All right, guys. Well, uh, sit tight. Thank you for uh, for flying along with us this evening. I'm going to send you over to one of our great friends that we met over in uh, San Diego. And that is our buddy Arctic Turn. Arctic Turn. I'm going to hope to spell his name right as I send you the raid so I don't send you to some random guy. But Arctic Turn is a great friend, and he always flies all of his streams for the uh, charity that, that he calls Hermanos. Hermanos VA is the uh, hermanosva.org is the uh, website for the VA that he flies for that is a that is a uh, a charity to uh, supply food medicine and supplies for a uh, for you know those in need in Venezuela and Latin America so great guy great streamer flying some jet stuff tonight but it's okay we'll we'll cut him some slack on that he's usually a good general aviation streamer so good to good one to follow if you're into this GA type flying like we do. But anyway, yeah, check out our friend Arctic Turn, give him a follow, and uh, like I said, support a stream for a good cause, guys. We will catch you Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time from uh, Dulles Tower. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Be uh, happy and healthy and safe in your own travels and your own adventures in the meantime. So take care. <laughs>